So we are going over a course. This course is um, Hillsdale College uh, Introduction to the Wonder and the Good for um, Introduction to Western Philosophy. We are the book club for this course. So um, I'm going to just go over the introduction here. Not too much of it. I want to go into the start, the actual course, but this is um, like the headmaster of the college or something. I don't know. He's the, the guy in charge and he's um, given an introduction for this course. And this is the bit that he says that drew me in right at the beginning of, of this. Complete uh, good. Can you hear that? In sports. They're representations of it. They're suggestions can everybody, of it. Hang on, Bev. Can you just pause it? But mm -hmm. And if you... If you admire, can everybody hear that? If you if you can, either say something or if you don't want to say something, just yeah, we can hear it. Okay, yeah, yeah, all right, perfect, perfect. Yep, yep, yep. What about everybody that new into this now? Have, have we got? Um, do they know what to click and that to click my live screen? Yep. So if you're if you're new in to Discord, if you click where it says live next to Bev's name in the list of names and say watch stream and you watch the stream you'll hear and be able if you want to be able to see you'll be able to see it but you'll certainly be able to hear it or, or, or even double click they even double click yeah. yep okay okay sounds good anybody got any problems with it yeah let us know right. people who do excellently in sports you often come to admire their characters too because the whole human being produces excellence but that, too, is incomplete, right? Because human beings don't last forever, at least in their earthly form. So this question of the good that's implicit in all that we do, it invites us to think above ourselves. And uh, that comes up constantly. Uh, and it's a pressing question. And, and it, you will have in your life, I am confident, uh, experiences with friends and teachers and stuff parents and children, you'll have golden moments when you have a really great talk about things, just things, and it will lead up to ultimate things. And the feeling that comes from having, sharing that with somebody is very powerful. And Aristotle describes that activity, when you have those conversations, as the highest human association the ultimate form of friendship, which is the highest human association. Another thing that uh, leads us to the good, the other word, is wonder. I wonder. It is wonderful. That means you can't really account for it. And you only talk about that, about things that are puzzling, sure enough, but also beautiful. Uh, it can be any kind of thing. Uh, around here, we have this experience all the time. Uh, aha. Students learn something great. And everybody takes pleasure in it. Often, we will learn it at the same time. And everybody's worked to learn it. And then it fits together. And, and you have sort of seen an answer. But the process itself is also wonderful. Wow. Wonder, look at that. That's a great thing to have happened. How did it happen? In other words, when we see beautiful, elevating, beckoning things, and we can't explain them, it leads us to think. If you see natural beauty, I guess my favorite natural beauty might be Yosemite Valley. And the point is, when you see it, it makes you just stop and look, and then you begin to try to describe it. And it's hard. How would you encapsulate that? How would you do that justice with your own speech? It's wonderful. And when we see things that are wonderful, they call us to think. And, and you know, the most serious thinkers, the great philosophers, they try to give coherent accounts of all that. And that's an enormous intellectual achievement. I teach Aristotle here pretty often. And uh, it's always great when one does that. In fact, all the classes here are great. All the ones that I teach are just a joy to me. And there are always moments in the classes 
where something emerges from our discussion based on the text usually that is some great and wonderful thing to know, wonderful thing to know. And once you know that thing, you're not finished. It calls you to think even more. Now those two things, the good and wonder, those are why we're interested in philosophy. I was going to read you a quote in a dialogue called the Theotetus, Socrates says, uh, Theotetus, by the way, is a young mathematician, brilliant young man, uh, shown and introduced to Socrates as a young man who's going to go far, and you should talk to him. And uh, Socrates says to this young man, I see, my dear Theotetus, that Theodorus, another fellow, had a true insight into your nature when he said that you were a philosopher. For wonder is the feeling of a philosopher, and philosophy begins in wonder. This, what this young man said to him was, he found some things wonderful, which meant you can't give a complete account of them. Philosophers are not people who possess wisdom, necessarily. They're people who love it, and they are given to wonder. Now, Another word about what we wonder about, um, perfect things. And how do we know what those are? Uh, Aristotle's account of it is, you see a thing, you can see what kind of thing it is. It's how we are able to use common nouns, how we're able to speak with each other. And by seeing what kind it is, you've acknowledged the standard to which it's supposed to conform. Now, kinds of things can also be more perfect than other things. And what, how do we tell if a thing is perfect? Well, uh, there are qualities that it has. Uh, in Aristotle in particular, uh, things are higher if they're self-sufficient, if they're complete unto themselves, if they don't need anything else. We human beings are obviously not that. Although, Aristotle says, our highest activity is the contemplation of these wonderful things. And it takes huge qualities of soul and character, intellect and character, in order to spend much time wondering, contemplating the beautiful things. And he says that's the most self-sufficient activity, although in us not completely self-sufficient, because he says, if you have a friend who's close to you, who's capable of that wonder that I described that breaks out in classes sometimes here, often, then you can do it better with the friend. Two is better than one, or three better than two. So self-sufficient things are more perfect. Uh, immaterial things are more perfect. What does that mean? That means if a thing's made out of matter, it sets a limit to it immediately. I wanted to uh, go over this. Uh, I, I didn't mean to for it to play that long. I was after the uh, the wonder part of it, but this guy just got it. Like grips you into this. Uh, I don't know. What what's what everybody think about that? The wonder. Uh, like I when I heard this originally, I thought this guy's talking about us here talking about these things that we end up talking about. Like, you can't have the conversations that we have in any of these other rooms. I know, I've tried. There just aren't people that are able to have these conversations that we're going to end up having through this. I know I'm happy with the group of people that we have here. I can have these conversations... I can ask people these sorts of questions, and we do quite often, don't we? Ask questions of, of each other. Absolutely. And I'll, I'll say for me, like this is personal to everybody, right? Which should be the point of philosophy in the way this guy's talking about it and the way that an, another guy that we'll listen to talks about it is is that philosophy in general is is personal to each and every human being 
because of the wonder, right? Like how he described that, like something that you can't account for. So uh, he, he, you know, there were paintings in the background, beautiful paintings and stuff. Like, I'll give you two examples f for me that created that wonder in me. Um, one was, and John will recognize this because it's near where, where he is. One is the first time I ever saw Niagara Falls. So in the physical world, that was one thing that awestruck. Like, I, you don't even know what to say. You look at it and you just, your mind starts to think things that you never thought before. And the second one for me was when my, when I saw my, uh, uh, my second child born, I wasn't there from the birth of my first child. Um, but my second child, when I saw my second child being born, that was another one of those moments. That's philosophy. It's that idea of wonder and being, at, at least again, for me, right? Maybe it's different for other people. And if you want to talk, this is the time to do it, right? Like, what is it? What does it mean to you? Is philosophy some stodgy thing with all the old books that are in the background behind that guy? And and that's what it is. And these old Greek names with, the, you know, the thing Plato or Aristotle or, you know, even modern ones, Kant or Descartes or, you know, pick what it, what, whatever philosophy you think um, means philosophy. But what does it mean to you? And I thought it the same thing gripped me that gripped Bev, the same point, is the wonder. Like these conversations that, that we have, these things that we just throw around with one another here on the Discord that we don't always get to the YouTube about, right? It's not about what Blue Marble Science said. It's not about what Mictoon said. It's not about any of that. It's not necessarily even about this arena of, you know, globe or no globe or you know, if you want to call yourself a flat earther with all due respect to Rob or not, right? It, none of that in itself really matters. It might to you to a certain extent, but it's really the wonder of it all. And and what gets your mind thinking and like, why does your mind run after these things? And can you share those with other people? And then what are those conversations like? And do you, do you feel like you can have those conversations? All of that kind of rushes to mind. Okay, so I'll shut up now. <laughs> and, and let other people talk yeah i like the idea i think the the idea of the wonder is what grips this entire community that we're in right there is a wonder because nobody has a proof we know that for a fact so there has to be an immense amount of wonder and people um blocking um them you know, having that wonder because they're so sure of what they know, yet they don't even know how they know what they do know. It, it's very strange. And these type of conversations will be difficult for a certain, you know, certain people, I think. I think, is this, he, he talks about the perfect, is it? Is this... Is this the part? Because he keeps going. Yeah, perfect. Yep. Yeah, is is all right. Everybody okay with that? If you if you're okay with it, just say silent, <laughs> or thumbs up in the chat, or yeah. whatever you want to do. Well, I I can't see the chat at the minute. So. I can. Okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm you keep an eye on that. Okay, so I'm yep. gonna I'm gonna carry on for this, and there's a little bit in this that may be a little bit more pertinent to, um what he says here about perfect, I think. Right. When, when you're wondering like describe about things. My favorite statue, oh, sorry. Michelangelo's oh. David. Sorry, go on. Hang on. Go on, John. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. When one, when one wonders about things outside the scope of reality, would that be considered philosophy? Sure. Why not? I'm just asking the question. Yeah. 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 I, yeah, I, I think so. Yeah. Okay. All right. Bye. By the way, word perfect. Uh, uh, it is uh, difficult uh, to translate it because uh, from our human point of view, perfect is, uh, it means literally finished. Mm -hmm. uh, to facere or factum est uh, and perfectum, it means it is 
done through as or thoroughly. It means that it is finished, completely, utterly finished. Uh, <laughs> but uh, in philosophy, where you, you are starting to speak about a perfection, uh, intellectual perfection, uh, it is, you, this word is not very appropriate but it is derived from our uh, physical reality, that it means really uh, just uh, utterly finished. So you cannot add anything to that to make it better. That's the word perfect. I'm finished. Yeah. No, that's good, yeah. that's good. I, I, let me just add something that, that to what John yeah, said. Uh, yeah, go ahead, Rob. Uh, before before you, uh, uh, Bev, is there a way you can uh, turn up the volume on the video uh, any louder, or is that a problem? Oh, on no, my no, end? no, I can, I can turn it up a little bit. Yeah, please, please do. Thank yeah. you, thank you. That's all. Okay, great. Yeah, and and there should be a volume control on that. I don't know if you're on the phone. Yeah, on your no, end on Discord, I yeah, think you can to turn, turn it, it up quite a lot on your yeah. end as well. Yeah, I'm driving, but yeah, I, I can still yeah. do. Yeah, yeah, I got. You. Okay, all right, so. I just want to address a little bit more of what John said, right? So does so John, can you state your question again just so I make sure I get it right? My question was when one wonders about things outside of reality, would you still consider that philosophy? Yeah. And and by reality you mean like physical reality, the things that we could touch, feel, see. Exactly. Smell, okay. taste, yeah. Right, right, right. Anything our senses can experience, yeah. Gotcha, gotcha. So so here's a question back, right, for everybody. Does anybody think that – I'm going to throw some things out that I don't think are physical reality, but you might. I don't know, and that's fine if you do. But does anybody think that when one wonders about um, other dimensions, uh, other universes um, – uh, if, what happens when we die? Uh, you know, other planes of existence, um, space, the globe, the flat earth, right? Whatever the, any of those things are, does anyone think that whoever's wondering about those things isn't either playing into a philosophy that they already have or creating a philosophy themselves? No, that makes sense. Right? And sometimes yeah. maybe philosophy and sometimes just ideology. Yes. Yes. But but, but either way, right, there's the, the idea of of philosophy or to your point, paper, right? Ideology or you know, whatever, you're still contemplating. It's still wonder, right? There may not be anything that you will, that you can ever, no destination that you can ever get to, right, with it. That's what I was but, going to ask. Does philosophy, can you resolve anything through philosophy? Well, mm -hmm. I it's a good question, right? I mean, the guy we're going to hear from next does talk about, briefly, about proof, right? And and we know that there's proof in, in Euclid, at least many of us believe that there is, other people talk about proofs, right? I mean, when you get down to it, that's really where you're where you're headed is what can you prove to yourself? Apple right? Hay, what I is think, is the uh, the ultimate goal, right? I think so. Yeah, that, that's Apple the Hay. ultimate state where you you're just comfortable with it. You you know what you know, and you know that you can't know certain things. Everything. And, yeah. Yeah. And you're and you're okay with it, right? Yeah. At some point, you go, yeah. So I, I can't have a proof for that, whether whatever the, that is. And but here's kind of what I think about it. So I have a call it a philosophy, right, or an idea around it. That's what I kind of think. It's my opinion. But I don't know. You do the shoulder shrug, right? Like I don't know. Yeah, but, I don't know that. But, but, but here's I'm okay what with I it. do know, right? This is this is what I do know. I know, and that's part that I know. I don't know. If I may address uh, John's question, because uh, when uh, John asked about things outside of reality, and you, Kevin, said about uh, 
let's say, uh, other uh, realms or whatever, uh, other realms or, or whatever, uh, they are still physical world, just imaginary, but mm -hmm. still physical. But uh, we can think about uh, things that we know that they are, and they are not physical, like our thoughts, or for example, like property or like quality. So uh, if we are talking about quality, he was the, this professor was talking about perfect, perfection. So it has some quality. What is quality? This is not ph physical thing, yeah, but it yeah. is because we are quantifying by that something. Uh, what is quant quantity and qu quality? W uh, there are things we can think about and they are not physical, for sure. So I, I, I would answer this uh, John's question in that way. Good. Yeah, good point. Thanks, Paper. I I would say the wonder is just something that comes to your mind that you start to wonder about. Now, you can get lost in those, which I think is why you have to have people around you, right, to help guide you. But also there, those people with their wonders will um, inspire wonders of your own. I think the, the, the conversations need to be had and it's the way that you uh, can express these. The uh, ultimate is the, is the goal because you're always going to have these ideas on your own, in your own head. But how do you express them? I, like I know that there's a, a lot of people who have uh, fantastic wonders. They're just unable to express them to anybody else. So they could seem slightly mad or crazy or whatever. I would say that conversation always will help uh, because uh, sometimes uh, people have objection uh, to s some thought, but they don't know uh, fully uh, what this objection means. But uh, after some time, uh, they could go into re realization uh, where they were wrong in objection and when they were right. I would uh, give you an example. Uh, uh, Beth was talking about a point that uh, we start uh, from nothing. And I objected that. In ontology, it means uh, in this part of philosophy where we are talking about ontos, it means entity. So uh, you cannot say that you can, can start from nothing because ontologically it is nonsense. But geometry, and this is this part which I realized after, that geometry is dealing with a uh, measurable uh, quantities or, or qualities rather so or ma uh, measurably measurable uh, magnitudes so uh, because point has no magnitude there is nothing to measure so in that sense uh, you can say that point is nothing because th there is nothing to measure. So in geometry, it would be nothing because zero, zero dimensions means that you cannot measure. So, so it is nothing. But in ontology still, it would be something. But I realized that this uh, geometrical part of my conundrum later without uh, this conversation with Beth, I wouldn't process that. But now I process that and I resolve <laughs> resolved this conundrum. So this is my personal example why we should talk. And 
even slightly disagree or argue. Yeah, but, that's what it's all about, isn't it? The argument, the the discussion yeah. of the progression of the argument is uh, the entire thing, and there's no need to get heated about it because we, you come to a resolution at the end of it. That's the that's the idea of the argument. Fantastic. I've had so many moments similar, but I can't express them like that. Thank you very much. Okay, we are we ready to move on a little bit now then? Everyone all right with that? I think so. Yeah. You okay, John? Yeah, I'm good, bro. Thank Sweet. you. And thanks, guys. Appreciate yeah. it. Oh, welcome back as well. Thank you. Welcome back. Good. Uh, right. It's not a very controversial choice because it is widely acknowledged to be one of the best. That's no, good. And it's made of white marble. And that changes it. If it were bronze, it would be dark. And no, it's made of white marble, and there's a purity about that. And that's right for that theme of this boy, unspoiled boy. It's young David, about the time of Goliath. And so he's pure. And the material uh, suggests that. Now, Moses, Michelangelo's statue of Moses, is nearby. And it's gray marble, darker, stormy, the lawgiver. He looks very firm sitting in his seat. Uh, thunder clouds around him, you know, that kind of thing. And so if it was white marble in the David, it wouldn't be as adaptable to make Moses. Uh, a third statue nearby in the same place in Rome is the Pieta, Jesus broken, taken down from the cross on the lap of his mother. And that's in shades of uh, off-white with touches of lavender. It's very gentle, right? Now, the point is, those materials are very adaptable to the specific purpose to which they were put, but not necessarily to other purposes. Matter is a limiting factor as well as an enabling factor. So if something could get along without any matter, it would be more pure, something that lasts forever. That means it doesn't decay, and that means it's more perfect. Uh, since immaterial is good, what is it that's knowable that's not material? The answer to that is thoughts. Aristotle actually derives the argument that uh, God is thought, but then what's the thought thinking about? Do you see how you can build up sort of by a process of elimination to this point I'm about to make? Uh, God couldn't have matter. Oh, uh, perfect things don't move. And the reason is motion is not complete until it stops being motion. So if it's this, you know, that's not complete. And then it stops and it's not motion anymore. Martian, motion is always a partial thing, right? So a perfect thing wouldn't move. Immaterial, wouldn't move, everlasting, self-sufficient. Aristotle describes God as having those things and God being a necessary deduction from the things that we see around us if we think hard enough. Uh, Nathan is going to tell you that the first query in the Summa Theologica is whether there's anything apart from reason that's necessary to know God. And the answer to that query is the very first one in that massive, wonderful achievement of a book. Uh, his, uh, the very f he says, yes, there are things apart from reason, but you can know a lot about it by thinking about it. Thomas Aquinas was a Christian saint, of course, and the uh, great recoverer and proponent of Aristotle in the medieval world, who'd been largely lost in the West. And he resurrected him and got his works out there and wrote about him a lot. And he set out to reconcile Christianity with uh, Aristotle's thought of an unmoved mover. How would you reconcile that to a God who cares about us, is love, and acts and moves and creates? Well, that's a big, tall order. 
to explain that. And Thomas Aquinas undertakes that in my favorite book by Thomas Aquinas called The Summa Contra Gentiles, the summa or the sum of the arguments against the non-believers is how it translates. And in the first book, in, uh, it's, it's about God, the first book is entitled God, uh, in chapters 45, 44, 45, 46, 47, 48, 49, in there, he actually, in about 15 pages, describes how the Christian God is also an unmoving and entirely self-sufficient God. Now, that's a philosophic argument as well as a theological argument. And since philosophy uh, is looking for the everlasting things, knowledge of the everlasting things, and the accumulation of knowledge of those things by living your life right to accumulate that knowledge, you can see how it leads necessarily on to theology. And it does in Aristotle, a pagan, and it does in Thomas Aquinas, a Christian saint. And, and it would need to do that, I think, unless, and you'll learn this from Nathan, in some modern philosophy, they chop philosophy up at the top. They actually decapitate it. And they say, you can't answer those questions anymore. What you can do, and this is a vast simplification, which is why I like it. I think it represents what you can do is you can remake the world any way you want it and stop wondering about the highest things and liberate your actions from that voice that talks to us all, that explains to us we'd really rather be good, wouldn't we? even if it might cost us our life. What if instead all we do is give up on philosophy answering the ultimate questions and make it a tool of power? And that's what happens in modern philosophy, I think. But of course, that's unsatisfactory too, which mm -hmm. means that modern philosophy can never fully triumph, no matter what one thinks. It can give rise, it has given rise to the great totalitarian regimes that can nearly conquer the world to vast scientific injustices on an enormous scale. And yet in the end, that won't work. I'll close with my favorite quote from uh, Winston Churchill. It's in an essay he wrote called 50 Years Hence, one of his best and one of the most important things. He wrote it in the 1930s, and I'll paraphrase a passage in that essay. He says... Uh, Imagine a race of beings who come uh, 16 or 17 generations in the future. And imagine that they've conquered nature. Imagine they can live as long as they want. Imagine they can have pleasures wider than any we can know. Imagine they can travel anywhere they want to go, including in planetary. That's a kind of a dream of the modern world, isn't it? And then Churchill asks, what would be the good of all that to them? What more would they know about the fundamental questions we must face? Why are we here? What are we for? What should we do? The life without philosophy is a despotic life. That's how Winston Churchill knew that Adolf Hitler was a bad man. You should study philosophy. It will make you free. Thank you. So I think a couple of opinions there, right? So a couple of opinions there. First, don't, don't really care what you think about Adolf Hitler or not, right? Yeah, this, yeah. this guy's opinion. Don't care. Doesn't matter. And also to note that Hillsdale College is a Christian theological college. But just because this particular guy linked it to a Christian God doesn't mean that's where we're going, right? That's what you have to do in a lot of these things is you have to take, I, I had a mentor of mine once a long time ago that said, um, take what you like and leave the rest. And I think when we, you know, when we continue to go through this, that's what you should focus on. Take what you like and leave the rest. So shouldn't it be take what you need and leave the rest? 
yeah, it could be, could be take what you need and leave the rest. I'm just telling you what he told me is take what you like and leave the rest. <laughs> <laughs> so, so yeah, but I, I wanted to make sure that I what knew we were going like to go over that. Bible? If you like yeah. it, then that's all, then that's all good. But I just wanted to make sure no I one do. was turned, turned off by any of that. Right. That, that the thing that struck me, I'll tell you what struck me about that, because I, as soon as I heard it, um, I responded back to Bev that this was, this was the thing that got me about that is the idea that nothing that's perfect can be in motion. Yeah, That's what too. he basically what he said, right? Nothing that's perfect can be in motion. And you can see why, right? Because anything that's in motion is constantly changing. Even if the it itself isn't changing, your perspective of the it is changing, right? So let's say you're, I don't know, you're, you're, we had discussed cats earlier today, right? So let's say you're, you're, you're watching your cat and your cat is moving. The cat's not changing because it's still the cat. But your perspective of the cat is absolutely changing because it's walking over here and it's walking over there and it's, you know, wagging its tail and it's, you know, you know, licking its leg or you know, it doesn't matter. If it's moving, it's changing. If it's changing by what this guy was talking about, it's not perfect. And immediately I started thinking about that's what all of these people who believe that we live on a spinning globe. That's one thing they'll never quite get or grasp, right? That if that's what you believe, that this ever-changing thing that we live on is constantly in motion, how can you ever th lay your hat on it and say, this is exactly how this thing is and it's perfect? I, I, I'm in agreement with this guy to, that says, you can't, you can't do that. Yeah. How do you... How do you nail down something that's constantly changing, constantly moving, and think that you perfectly understand that thing? It, to me, it shows the inversion of everything, right? That in the past, obviously, if these were the views and God was that, then um, how could you be moving, right? So it's it's never been known whatever they talk about it's obvious that in all of this time even in thomas aquinas time right if he re, re renewed it and he also had that opinion this guy has that opinion also then how can you possibly believe that you're constantly in motion it's it's an inversion of a natural state of knowing that you are taught to believe nowadays that there are contradictions because that's got to be a blatant contradiction. Right. Got to be. E yeah, absolutely. Even our language, right? Even our language states the idea of the immovable, Im immovable, right? Yeah. Like if you're thinking about a, a subject or you're contemplating something, it doesn't matter how trivial it is. And you go, yeah, that seems solid, right? That's solid. That I, the idea, the if you're talking about a, like I'm a process person at work, right? Yeah, you go, yeah, that's solid. That's so What does that mean? It's 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 immovable. It's there. It's a rock. You could think all these metaphors come to your mind. For those of us that are Christians, we know that that's a description of our God, right? Immovable, all those kinds of things. But it's the same way with anything. If you're Buddhist, right? Buddha doesn't change, right? The philosophy is the philosophy. That's what that's what you know to be true. You know it to be true. It's a proof to yourself. Yeah. Right? Water doesn't curve, as an example. By the way, Buddhism has no God. There is no God in Buddhism. Yes, there you go. Yeah. They they adore nothingness. So their final happiness is just nothingness this nirvana state is just nothingness you feel nothing you think nothing you are nothing it's all good yeah. all good yeah yeah <laughs> the buddhist you said paper yes okay this is nirvana this is 
state of absolute happiness uh, where you don't think, don't feel, just like being uh, nothing. Yeah, well, how can you that can be considered happiness if you can't experience uh, it? I don't know. <laughs> As a Buddhist, not me. <laughs> it's ultimate epa hey. <laughs> Yeah, I think yeah. epohe is different, actually. Yeah. <laughs> myself. At, at but... least this is your choice. Epohe is your choice of your mind, but right. in that yeah. state, you are not making any choice, choices anymore. Ultimate. Okay, let me get this uh, next one up here. Right. And um, now. That was just the introduction. That that guy's the headmaster of the the course or whatever. Now this this next guy, this is the one uh, I think where special things happen. I don't know whether we will be pausing this one, Kevin. What do you reckon? I think we'll. I'll pause it. Strategic moments. I yeah, think, yeah. Strategically, because he, he yep. does go through this. Um, okay. going on here we refresh the page and if anyone doesn't understand any of the terms that are used or the um you know like if you've never read plato not plato the stuff that i used to love when i was a little kid but Plato, P-L-A-T-O, if you've never read any of that or, or anything, stop and, 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 and ask us because we'll be getting into, well, this guy's going to be getting into some of that. I and think we, we should get into We don't into, want anyone to be lost. We definitely yeah, need to get into it. We need to go over the Republic specifically, but there are other plays as well. They all have, a, I think, the strategic purpose, all of them, um, in pushing a particular narrative. And we won't tell you, at least I, I like, right? Bev and I have had discussions about this. We won't tell you what we think about these characters, whether it's Plato or Socrates or any of these other characters, right? About, yeah, they're good or they're bad or they're whatever. You guys decide on your own that, right? Yeah. But, uh, yeah, so. Uh, I have a technical question. Uh, Rep Republic, uh the state or uh, politeia? politeia? Uh, th this is this? Uh, Plato's the Republic. It's uh, one of his... Uh... Yes, yes, but, but uh, Republic is just, uh, uh, let's say, English name from Latin, but uh, uh, that's why I am asking about uh, if it is politeia or the state. It's it's both, isn't it? He, I think he uses the the Republic to um, show the connection between um, the state and the. Uh, I, I am asking person. about title because I, I know this uh, like in Polish transla translation is the state. In fact, because he is talking about uh, generally about state or regime not especially republic i think but uh, but uh, i think that uh, it is poeia in in uh, greek so it is just political matters uh, like in state That's uh, yeah. why i was asking why republic because for me this word doesn't fit thing i think very yeah much. the trend uh, yeah the translation i think you're right paper the translation is it, it could be state, right? It is essentially, so when we talk about that, right? Plato's Republic is essentially what kind of, in this case, city, right? What kind of city or government or whatever would you create if you could create one? Like you did a thought experiment and said, this is how I'm going to set up my city, state, uh, uh, if you're in the United States, state, country, you know, kingdom, whatever thing that you want to call it, right? That political body or entity. Yeah. How, how, how would you do it? How would you set it up? 
and that and in the book the republic socrates discusses uh how that might be done isn't though isn't the Re republic really right they're having a discussion with socrates about this mm -hmm. sort of stuff and um, yep. they ask him uh, about the good Right and yes, the he just, the uh, just well yeah to people right what is it to be just and he yes. says um he can't really explain it in person you know mm -hmm. like because he doesn't have the words or whatever and what he chooses to do is to say well we'll compare the person to the state or the republic right and then he tell he sort of explains all of the intricacies of a republic but it's all in relating to the the just you know the the person i think that's what i got out of it anyway so it's it's like i so many depths to the to the actual republic when you know you can wrap yeah, yourself up in book. knots with it definitely for the attempts and everything but i mean yeah we we will definitely be going over this republic you can go over it many times with different people and no doubt you'll end up uh, learning more through discussions i think anyway so right we we all right to listen to the uh the beginning of this i'm all right uh, i'll be right back for three minutes okay okay, okay. Well, well, let's go. Can you guys see that screen? I can. I'm Nathan Schleter, and I'm a professor of philosophy and religion at Hillsdale College. Oh, wait. I need to begin wait, with some bad news. Black. Is it? It's black. Yeah, it's black. <clears throat> there we go. Okay, I don't think I can make it any bigger. So, yeah, I'll have to do in that little screen. But then I'll give you some good news. The bad news is I'm not teaching this course. The good news is we've got a great lineup of teachers for you. They include Plato, Aristotle, Thomas Aquinas, Descartes, Kant, Friedrich Nietzsche, C.S. Lewis. They're going to be your teachers in this course. You might think of me as a tour guide, and you might think of philosophy as a tour. You know how valuable a tour guide is when you visit a foreign country somewhere you've never seen before. How useful it is to have someone who knows that territory, who can take you to the landmarks, the the historic sites point out things to you that you'd be looking at, but you wouldn't notice or you wouldn't know what they meant. And so I'm going to be your tour guide, if you will, on this journey through the great books of philosophy. And the tour is through books. Now, I did not choose all of the great books of philosophy. These are 12 of my favorite books in philosophy that I think will be valuable to you. And I chose these books because I think they, they tell a kind of story. The story is this. In the beginning, philosophy is a discovery of reason. That's how philosophy begins. But, and, and that's a magnificent discovery, and it's fraught with difficulty and with promise. And then philosophy comes in, in contact with Christian revelation, and that creates a whole new kind of dynamism. And then philosophy takes a turn in the early modern period towards rationalism. And we will talk about the origins of that new conception of reason that occurs at the beginning of modern philosophy. But that project seems to collapse and results in postmodern philosophy and what I call a crisis of reason. Finally, we'll look at how C.S. Lewis addresses the crisis of reason, which is really the crisis of the West in his book, The Abolition of Man. Now here's a teaser. C.S. Lewis in The Abolition of Man has a number of quotations in it. And the longest passage in the entire Abolition of Man is from Plato's Republic. And we're going to read that quote today. And then I hope you will remember it when we get to the last lecture because we'll refer back to it. Now, you don't have to read these books 
to get something out of these lectures. I hope that you will find them engaging and interesting and enlightening without reading. But I would really encourage you to get these books and to read them. At the very least, uh, I would recommend that you read the excerpts that accompany each of the lectures. With this course, I've included a course guide. And in that course guide for each lecture is a PDF excerpt of the reading along with focus questions, an outline, and some historical background on that thinker. So what a great opportunity to follow along and become a kind of partner with me in this course of study. Better yet, what I really recommend you do is get your friends together and make this a book discussion. R watch the lecture, read the reading together, and have a discussion about it. I think you'll find that that's a great opportunity for enriching your friendships and for deepening your understanding of philosophy. Ah, uh, okay. That's so what we're doing. That's us, right? That's exactly <laughs> what we are doing right now. Um, and not because this guy's told us to do it, because Logos has led us here. This is exactly what we've been doing all along. And this... Um, hey, hang on, hang on, hang on. We can do it because he said so, because it's a good idea. Uh huh. Can, can um, I uh, make uh, a comment on something I don't agree with that he sure. said right from the yeah, beginning? Yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah. Uh, when he said that we need a tour guide to take us to the places we need to see, I don't agree with that at all. I think you should explore on your own and think on your own. But give you an example. We have some shit docked in a harbor here, uh, old naval ships on the Niagara River. Uh, went with a couple of friends to take a tour. As soon as the tour started, we took off and went off in the hatch down below the boat on our own, and we saw things that the rest of the tour never saw and learned. So I'm just saying a tour guide is going to lead you. I mean, if you can really trust your tour guide that he's going to take you to the places you really need to see, Okay, but I would say explore on your own. I, I, I don't agree with that part. I just wanted to say that. Yeah, I'm done. so yeah, it's a great point, John. Totally great point, John. And, and I agree with you as well. There, let me say a couple things. First, I think this, that was this guy's way of saying, look, I'm not a typical professor who's just going to sit here and lecture you and give you my thoughts on things because I've published these 10 books and that's the text that we're going to go through. That's number one. I think that's why I use the metaphor of a tour guide that the real people that are teaching the course, as he said, are, you know, Aristotle, Plato, Socrates, and he lists, you know, all, all these even to, to more modern day type characters. Right. So I think that's number one. But number two, the idea of going through this as a book club is to your point. Right. It is to get off of that bus or that tour guide tour and start exploring it on your own. If you don't do that and you only get the classroom instruction and you're not really talking about these things, you miss a ton. You're exactly right, in my opinion. Okay, great, great point. Thank you. Yeah, I'd say, John, as well, that this guy's saying he's a tour guide. But to me, this guy's on a tour guide to take us on a journey to talk about different things. Now, the conversation that we have is what I'll learn from. Not from the words that these guys go through, but the process that happens and occurs in my head that I come to the realisations. Now, that'll occur through the conversations that all of us have. So, I'd say that we are actually, or you guys are the ones that are going to be helping me right this guy's just a tour guide to take us to show us different things but you guys are going to be going on the journey we're going to be seeing what you see right yeah i understand what he's saying i just mm. want to make everybody aware that you should expand beyond just what they're telling you and you know ask questions or explore deeper that's oh, all absolutely i have um i have i have an input really so I feel a little bit comfortable, Ray, right, with the way he uh, presented uh, uh, the historical facts, right? He spoke about the collapse of reason. Can we really speak about the collapse of reason? 
Well, can we say that? We'll get we, into that later on. Yeah, no, let, let's hear Skeptic out, though. Yeah, go on. Go on, Skeptic. No, because uh, the guy spoke about the collapse of reason. Can we mm -hmm. really speak about that? Is reason or can reason be collapsed? In a society, yes. so here, yes. In a societal <laughs> perspective, yes, it can be. All you have to do is look at what's happened, at least maybe not where you are skeptical, I'm not sure, but certainly in the, in the majority of the West over the last three years. Right. What's happened in the last three years in the in these Western countries is a full on collapse of reason. The right. Just let's just take because we're not on YouTube. We could talk about this stuff here. Right. Let's just talk about the idea of putting a cloth over your face and expecting a microorganism that is 100 times smaller than the pores in the cloth not to go through the cloth. Like it wasn't even there to potentially infect someone else. That is the collapse of reason. And entire entire cultures, countries, um, it's we're susceptible to that that loss of reasons. Reason. So yes, in a in a in a great a grand perspective, like a a cultural perspective, yes, to me it absolutely can collapse. Can a person lose their reason? I, I maybe that's yeah, arguable. Misologists. I don't know. Misologists, Misologists I suppose. Yeah, 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 yeah. Or just uh, like dementia, this mental people with mental issues, real. That's and, a good point. Uh, for example, uh, there are some people who uh, who are uh, mentally disi disabled, literally from uh, from uh, the very youth. I saw that people, they uh, they act uh, like animals. They they cannot produce any thought thought. I I I I met that kind of people. They behave just like monkeys. I I met that people. So I, I know what I am talking about. So there there are completely mentally disabled people. They are. Mm -hmm. Well, I would say anybody that can hold a contradiction mm. is, you know, like you've given up reason. Yes, but this kind, this uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, instance is that he is using his reason to reject his reason. Mm -hmm. So still, he is not mentally disabled. He is sacrificing a greater good for smaller good um, but we are <laughs> arriving into ethics yeah also because wh why he is doing that because obviously he is doing that and uh, we, we should ask also why he is doing that but to do that he has to use his reason so just motivation is unknown let's say hatred We okay? I am okay. We we're ready to carry on. Everything resolved. Let's go. We're also going to take a tour through some pretty difficult ideas, and I don't want you to be intimidated about those ideas. Uh, they sound scary at the beginning, but I'm going to walk you through it, and by the end, you're going to be confident. I'll include a glossary and the guide and the course guide, so if you forget what some of these things mean, you can go back and look at them. Uh, the third thing that we're going to be going through are some big questions. To anticipate, does God exist? Is there objective moral truth? How do we know whether truth exists? What is a liberal arts education? If I've got you there with those questions, you're in for a good time because we're going to be going through them in some depth. Now, I need to warn you about some things before we get started. Uh, the first thing is that philosophy is not about validating the things you already believe. So you're going to have to get used to asking questions that might make you a little bit uncomfortable. When I teach philosophy at Hillsdale College, on the very first day, I have the students memorize 
the wise man loves to be corrected. I want you to think about what that means. The wise man loves to be corrected. How many of us love to be corrected? Just think about that for a moment. But why not? Socrates said, I love to be corrected because it makes me better. I substitute truth for error. So we need to think about that in this course. How do we grow in truth? Secondly, you need to get used to being on. I like that. I like that a lot. I get to substitute truth for error. Makes me better. That is beautiful. It is. I'll let me play the other side of that. What is truth? <laughs> and and right? And who uh, who determines what truth is? That's also a conversation we might en end up having. Mm. I'm sticking to Aristotle's definition. <laughs> until, until someone will show me better. Yeah. But uh, for two over 2,000 years, nobody uh, delivered better. Oh, I'm Fair pretty enough. confident that this is a pretty much good definition. Yeah. Okay, I'm sorry. Can I interrupt for just a second? Can. Paper. Yes. No, oh, no. It's what paper said. Paper. Can you refresh my memory on Aristotle's definition? The truth is, if it's not, if, if it's not too much to take away from what we're talking about, uh, the truth. This Aristotle. This is Aristotle's statement. The truth is agreement or correspondence. Our thought with what we see and uh, if uh, when he was talking about seeing uh, it means uh, what we are per perceiving from a reality so it has to be agreement between our thought and what we perceive from reality this is and we, if we have this agreement or correspondence we have truth because okay, uh, thought separated from reality is just an opinion. Are you are you referring to the correspondence theory or theory of correspondence? No, no. I am referring that uh, that our thought has to match reality. So, for example, I if I, I th if I think <laughs> about triangle, and I am seeing triangle, it means that uh, I have some kind of truth of that. But if I uh, uh, I am thinking about triangle, but I uh, cannot see triangle anywhere because I'm blind, uh, therefore I will not have truth, fully truth, just uh, thought. So it has to be correspondence between reality and our thought. If th there is correspondence, we can have truth. Otherwise, this is not yet truth, just thought, maybe fantasy. Who knows? In other words, in plain English, are you saying I can't be looking at a giraffe and thinking of a mouse? Uh, this example is just visual reality, but, but uh, for example, uh, if we, uh, it it may refer to that kind of thing. Yes, also. Well, but, one aspect, yeah. But 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 still, uh, it has to be correspondence with uh, because thought is, is purely something in uh, in our mind. This is not outside of us. But to have truth, Aristotle said, we have to check it with outside reality, objective reality. Because his uh, definition of true uh, truth was uh, to find objective truth, not my truth, just my fantasy, what I think is true. We have to check with reality, and reality is outside of us. So it has to be okay. match between us the, and outside reality. Yeah, the, I've just put in the in the chat. It comes up a bit later. The divided line. And this is what they uh, considered back in the day as uh, thought. 
So thought was the mathematical side of it, right? It's the, the brain processing that actually can process what it is that you're thinking of, the thought. And, and well, that is above the things and the images. So what paper's saying is that the actual thought process has to match what you both see within the things and the image of what you see. They all have to match together. I need to interrupt. Because I've seen weird phenomena, you might say. I put a video in the agent's live chat that I think has a lot to do with what we're talking about, but it confuses me even more now. Because what you see and what you hear, how do you know it's true when it can change in an instant? Please, everybody, watch the video first a couple of times. It's 15 seconds. And understand what is going on inside our brains. Mm, uh, this is... Um... Rob, the, the, the problem is that, uh, first, Aristotle uh, uh, hadn't got uh, vi any videos, uh, and at that time, uh, uh, nobody. Uh, but, uh, so he was referring just to our senses, solely. Uh, not, no, no, I understand. But, but you are, if you are talking about video, it means that this is image of the image. Or picture of the image of the picture, so you oh, are you, you you are looking at the screen and you are you you are not looking at reality with your senses. You are looking at the screen. Oh. All right, I, I get that. But did you watch the video? No, 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 no. I am I, just talking I, I about I, the the process. About but this, the truth. because we started we started with truth, right? My the whole reason we haven't started the video back up is because we're talking about truth. And if you watch this video a couple of times, which one is the truth? It's for you, Rob. And by the way, the truth. No, no, I, I understand. No, Bev, I totally get that. But both can be true at the same time. No, if they are contradictory, not. But but uh, it. You may have doubt about uh, <clears throat> that something is not true, but I, uh, no, in okay, this, okay. maybe you guys need to watch the video a couple times first, and then see if I'm just way off base. I might be off in the weeds somewhere. Yeah. So this is this is why I said, like, what is truth? Right. Defining what truth is might be important. Right. So. And, and I think what paper laid out, at least for himself, right, is truth to him is Aris, what Aristotle talks about. And personally, I and, and skeptical came came back and said, are you talking about the correspondence theory of truth? I, I think the answer to that question is yes, I believe that is what Aristotle was talking about. The correspondence theory of truth is a thing. Anybody can go look it up if you want to. Basically, it describes what paper described, right, that your thoughts need to line up with reality and then the question becomes well what is reality then and what well, are your thoughts i mean what like, are your what, thoughts what's going on it's up, crazy right? isn't it yeah because as we know just in this arena right let's let's take it to this arena that we've all been in right so there are people that say that they can see earth curve from the ground right that is with their reality that is what they see that is their that is the truth to them right they think it is exactly so, they so think it is going back to rob's example the truth is that he saw a video this is truth mm -hmm. but what was true in that video uh, uh we cannot say so uh uh, we don't have truth. It's like, for example, uh, if uh, we have blind people, blind person, he will never 
uh, know what the color is. So he will not know the, tr the truth about colors. Uh, someone w would uh, describe to him uh, and name it red, brown, or white, or whatever, but he will never know what it is white. So he will never know the truth about color. Because Do blind because... people have any internal visualizations? If you're uh, blind from birth. Blind good question. Per, blind blind person, person has no, uh, uh, cannot have that kind of imagination like we have. We, we can produce uh, through our memory image of thing, of uh, the thing, for example, car. We can imagine car because we uh, saw before the car we want we we know what car is so even uh, we can imagine non-existing car with four wheels and um, mask and uh, this old old stuff but, but what about yeah, have nothing to reference it to what but about through touch can they create that image oh god that's that's such a i never even thought about that that's such an interesting conversation wow i never even thought of that what we, they have nothing wow. to reference it to. Yeah, I get that, but they can yeah. they can touch things and can they create an image that way? Is my question. yes, but not visual. Th that would be an image of their uh, me let's say muscle memory. They wow. have that memory. Wow. So if they are recognizing faces with touching, uh, this is touch sense, and they memorize that. So uh, they memorize their uh, movement. Uh, this uh, sh shape, but uh, in touch sense, not in not visually. Wow. So, they can imagine a shape like a, a sphere, a triangle, something that's curved, something that's straight. They can get that, but a yes, picture but, like a vi that they'll never because they have no references. Yeah, but they this uh, like let's say a triangle uh, or cube or whatever they uh, touch it and they uh, memorize this uh, edges uh, and uh, surfaces uh, smooth surface and edges etc et but by I just thought of sorry paper I just thought of something do blind people dream mm, uh, all why not? Interesting stuff. I, I would wow. I would say and if I, they do then they might have something to reference this is what yeah. I'm trying I never thought of this before it just we came to mind to a blind but, person. but but in dreams you also have uh, not visual but audio so I would say that uh, they they may what do dreams. you mean you have no visual of course you have visual we can, in a dream can we even begin no, to but... imagine what colors are between ourselves rather than involving right. um somebody that's lost one of the senses i mean like surely we'd be better having a discussion with somebody who actually like that rather than trying to imagine something right. Right. yeah it just came to mind though it's fascinating do blind people dream I never thought of that, but anyways, it's besides the point. I would say yes, but not visually, but only uh, out. This is audio because they you can think, hear. You still. Think? <laughs> we can't answer Probably. that question. Yeah, uh, going back to what Rob Rob's point, right? I think this is where Epo, Epo Hay, I think this is where Epo Hay comes in, right? The idea that that you cannot know or you may not know, right? So so. Let's say that someone experiences something and and you have a discussion with an, with another person, right? Let's say that that thing that you experienced is, I, I don't know, call it um, extra reality, right? It's, it's, it's not something in reality. Let's call it what it is. You had an experience with a ghost or an extraterrestrial or whatever you want to call it, right? You know, it doesn't really matter. And you were trying that to you, that is your truth. You had that experience. You have acknowledged it. You're not out of your mind, at least hopefully you're not out of your mind. And, and but and so that's your truth. 
when you discuss it with somebody else, right, that hasn't had that experience, can you come to a truth about it? No. Collectively. No. No. But no. there are some things that you can. For example, like, 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 like physical objects, like triangles, squares. So uh, if we have uh, something on the screen like a square, and we can all see that this is a square, so we can uh, come to consensus. Consensus, but, consensus, yes. Yes, but, but uh, because uh, our senses uh, generally works in the same or very similar way. So yeah. we cannot be mistaken that this is not a square because this is triangle. So, but see, see, l let me give you um, an example, right? Imagine, right, we have a strawberry. So if you eat it, uh, Kevin or PayPal or anyone else, so let's say if you eat it, uh, if I tell you, can you describe how tasty it is? Right, so that 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 experience you had, it's your first person experience. Mm -hmm. I would never ever ever have. I would never ever so sort of get to the exact taste how it is because it's personal. Yes, agreed, and and it's subjective as well, right? You, yeah, even if that... you even if you had everybody that liked the strawberry, what you're talking about, how would you ever get to to describe that and come to some sort of consensus? You. you what about if you don't like person. it? To experience it themselves, yes. Yeah, yeah. What if, what if you have somebody that doesn't like strawberries at all? Like, or allergic. Yeah, you can't come to a truth there. So yeah, there's subjective, there's subjectiveness to some of those things as well. And this is a really good conversation, and it's at the very beginning of of this whole thing. And we lost Rob, so I don't know if that's it, he just lost or he had to go or whatever. I, that's unfortunate because. I think it's important to keep in mind that epo hey, right? That if if the consensus in this group, let's talk about just consensus in this group, is that Aristotle's idea of truth is that thought and reality need to match up. And that can be for a, a person, an individual, true enough, or it can be for a group of people if you're trying to come to a consensus then anything beyond that is epo hey it's like i don't know i can't know i need to be okay with the fact that i can't know at least for now and reserve judgment yes and aristotle was talking about uh, things that we can confirm so uh, for example uh, if we are going to athens uh, so we know that we are in athens not in in rome <laughs> so uh, it means uh, that our senses are telling us and we know that we are in athens and not in rome and that is truth for us mm -hmm. this this knowledge we think we think that we are in athens and we can see that we are in athens so it is true i i'm talking about uh, things that uh, can be confirmed by senses uh, for sure, not taste of uh, this or because uh, you know the, people ha ha have different ta tastes. Too subjective. Yeah. But but to not realize in which uh, town or city you are, uh, it, it is not. <laughs> that's not the case because if you are on Acropole or Acropolis. Uh, you know that you are in Athens, no, no problem. So, so uh, I, he was talking about things that you can confirm for sure, not doubtful things. Yeah, and th this is this. I'll tell you why this is so. This discussion is so important about about truth because, and we had it before, right? With with uh, Mishu when, when we when, right Bev when 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 Raven first started <laughs> yeah, yeah. this whole. Yeah, I mean, we had this going conversation be going for all the time, isn't it? it yeah, it is. It's, we're going to have to rehash it over and over and over again. But it is it, it is so important because it, here's what here's what could end up happening. And if you do get into philosophy, you'll learn this with the modern day philosoph quote philosophers, right, that end up 
deconstruct there's a there's a, a modern philosophical term called deconstructionism and what that is is some philosophers have gone to the point on this truth right and subjective truth and you know what can be proven and can't proven or tr what is truth and not truth all they've 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 done that to such a granular nature that they've deconstructed everything that came before it to the point where they can actually convince themselves while they're in Rome that they're in Athens. Do you see what I'm saying? They they can convince themselves that even okay. though they're biologically a man, they're a woman. Do you see where this can can lead this kind of thing can lead? So uh, you know, everyone needs to be careful with the uh, taking whatever their philosophy is too far, gr too granular, to where it all, it's all meaningless. Then it all becomes meaningless in the end. Yeah, yeah. So right? you can you you can sort of if you if you as you said if you uh, go too far. You can label United States as UK or yourself man like man into a woman. Mm -hmm. Do you understand? It's just a matter of labelism, right? Changing yes. names. You're not sticking to the what the collective um, have agreed upon. No, right, it's not what you... the collective agree upon. It's the truth. Right, right. We're talking about truth, and it's. Yeah. It's a personal thing, but the actual truth can be verified by other people, right? You you need to other people to check it. Otherwise, you could be false in well, your yeah. confirmation of something comporting with reality, because that's what we're talking about here. I mean, Paper just said at the beginning that he went with what Aristotle said, but I mean... That's what Aristotle said. That yes, has... By the way, if the truth is only subjective, it, if, means, if it... It, it means that proofs are meaningless. Because, uh, and th this is uh, why, for example, Brenda is saying that uh, uh, he doesn't care mm -hmm. uh, about proofs. Because it is outside uh, of his imagination. Uh, he many times said that uh, 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 he he doesn't bother with uh, out objective uh, truth because uh, only subjective, but subjective truth uh, is not verifiable. Because why and uh, by but what means you can uh, falsify if uh, you cannot check it with uh, objective reality. It's not falsifiable, so uh, it, it is uh, pointless to trying to disprove uh, solipsist because, in fact, that kind of people are just solipsists, and solipsist mean that this is solo. I am only one, and everything is pr just my projection. So whole reality, whole world, is just my projection. So I am not talking to real person. Uh, I am talking to my projection, and my projection cannot falsify me. So funny you should say that. What you guys were talking about, what Bev said about that, your opinion is what that what uh, Aristotle said, right? Now, funny, I was reading a thing just about that yesterday, about how the scientific method was established by pre. Um, Aristotelian and other people uh, was it an examiner I think it was that the whole idea of the scientific method was to ditch and go against what people like that said and to test and verify things so interesting this comes up I posted the article in uh, that text channel by the way fascinating read So you get what I'm saying, paper. The whole idea. I, I'm not of... sure. So, so it was against uh, a real scientific method. You say? No, no, no. 
the first notion that the scientific, how it came about, according to what I read, was that just the opposite of what you were saying, like you think the truth means what this man said. I'm not picking on you. I'm just, it just brought that to mind because a lot of people will say, yeah, I'll, I'll agree with what he says or I'll agree with Newton or this, whatever. I'm not picking on you personally. But the idea of the scientific method came about of thought against that kind of intellectual uh, ideology of going by what one person said and daring to go against the uh, common uh, accepted knowledge or accepted truth or whatever. That's, I don't know if that's more clear. Okay, 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 I understand. But yes, it means <clears throat> that uh, it may be uh, against consensus. So, uh, and Aristotle uh, uh, was writing about theory. So uh, he all, he very often uh, was saying that this theory can be replaced by by better theory, uh, because he didn't knew uh, everything. But uh, still, uh, we are talking about consensus between people. But he, uh, no, no, the... no, not necessarily paper. This is what I'm trying to tell you. It's a consensus, maybe, but based on the opinion of one person held in high esteem, like Aristotle, oh, okay. Plato, uh, whoever, pick, pick a philosopher, you know. Uh, I would say that, uh, this is definition, this is not opinion. You can say, you, you can, that's why I said that. Okay, so uh, this is his definition, maybe a subjective definition, but uh, through over 2,000 years, nobody brought better. So why would I change this definition to something else? Because it has to be logical. Definition has to be logical. And for me, Aristotle's definition of truth is very logical and it just perfect. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. I'm not, I'm not agreeing or disagreeing with you. I'm just, just came to mind that, what uh, the subject that you were talking about. It's not necessarily if it's true or not. It's the concept of daring to go against the like Einstein, for example, right? He's the, it, it, the opinion might be. Uh, like collectively by everyone right like you were saying but it's based on this one man and when somebody speaks out it's like you're speaking out against this individual great man so i, I don't know if you know what i'm saying yes 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 uh, but still uh, i would say that the, this aristotle's definition is so good because it's not referring to any opinion it's mm. just referring to what you see your thought and reality, not uh, others' opinion. So you are making your own judgment of reality. Yeah, personally, I agree with that. I'm not saying I don't disagree with it. Yeah, but I'm just saying the scientific method, how people started um, going against this kind of thought, this is where the scientific method, this was the first instance of where the scientific method came to be. Like daring to go against uh, the five elements, for example, or, you know, whatever a great man said and everybody had to follow type deal. Yes, yes, I, I understand. Yes. So professor said the oracle has spoken and now we believe that we live in the exactly. now, dimensions. Yeah, now we have our truth. And exactly. Exactly. And that be that becomes truth, and that's that's what we carry forward is truth. Yep. Yeah. And daring to go against that is what what how the scientific method was brought to be. Right. And 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 I think it might be okay for this, you know, as we and I know we've taken a long time, Bev, to come back to this, but and Rob is back, so I don't know if Rob is okay now, where because he missed a good chunk of what we were talking about, but I. I, I will say this. Uh, it may well be that the things that... Yeah, I'm sorry. I had, had, a, phone, I had a phone call from California. Okay, all right. So and I job. had to answer it. That, that's I, all right. I, I don't I, know what I missed. Is the thing. 
I, I think I can probably summarize in in that it, what, it may be that when we as a group come together and we're talking about truth, right? It may be that we can only agree as a group around what we can actually see, observe in reality, right? Like we might not be able to get to to other things and then have some kind of agreement on truth. Like I think somebody, even when I was giving the example of uh, of the um, you know wearing the cloth and and having a, a, a microorganism smaller than to hundred times smaller than the pores in the cloth. I think, I don't know if it was Benny or somebody else was was saying microorganisms. I mean, even stuff like that, right? I don't know. Have I ever seen a microorganism? No. Uh, do I know they exist? No, right? It's to, It goes to what SE said, right? Somebody said somewhere that there's these microorganisms and they, they account for things that we call disease. Do I know that to be absolutely true? Would I stake my life on it if somebody held a gun to my head? No. I wouldn't, right? But other people would say, yeah, go ahead and pull the trigger, man, because I know that's a fact. We, not, we might not be able to agree on all of that. And it's okay if we only agree on a subset of things that are truth or that we might all consider truth. I think it, as we're discussing things, it's important to have those conversations and disagreements. Like, I don't think that's true. Or, yeah, I do think that's true. Or let, let's discuss it, discuss why that is, because that's how we build, com to me, that's how we build community. And we don't get to the point where we want to kill each other, which is what society ends up doing, quite honestly. I think there's a, there's a point where we should point out as well, like knowing in this particular arena that you're in, that um, there will always be somebody who will want to disagree with you. So in me saying that it is your truth, uh, you can't have a consensus with everybody because if somebody just keeps going, no, -uh, no, not that, then you are never going to come to an agreement. So it, does that mean that you're never going to find truth because somebody just keeps saying, no, -uh, like your truth still there. Like you're going to, you have to put out at some point that, it is you. It's on you for you to find it. And you can't really argue with people about something. You have to come to an agreement that uh, everybody's allowed to have their own truth, let's say. But the conversation should still be able to be there about that right. thing. This has been a really good conversation, man. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, one more sentence about the Aristotle's definition. Uh, I don't uh, seek any uh, better definition because I didn't found, didn't yeah. find anyone. Uh, but uh, also, I am not that kind of person. But this is me uh, that uh, would like to reinvent the wheel. Once uh, the wheel is invented, I am not trying to reinvent again. So uh, if this definition is invented and it is good, I will stick to that. So I will feel if someone can bring better. But as I said, for so many years, nobody produced any better. Yeah. So this it's wheel never is been good documented, for me. at least. At least, yes. <laughs> Five minutes in. Wow. Are we all right to carry on? Let me, let me go back. A bit. Uncomfortable error. So we need to think about that in this course. How do we grow in truth? Secondly, you need to get used to being uncomfortable with your ignorance. It's it's an unpleasant thing. I I come home from te a day of teaching and my mind is filled with ideas and and there's anxiety because I've gained so much knowledge in something I've learned. But every time we make an advance into reality, we learn something new, new vistas open up. Think about the knowledge of your best friend. Do you ever know your best friend fully, completely, perfectly? Every gain in knowledge is, is a surprise, but then there's something more to learn there. 
And finally, I just wanted to let you know that... That's worth pointing out, though. That this is uncomfortable. A lot of this stuff, finding your ignorance, finding your own ignorance in something. And quite often, I find that when you are asking a question, or me, I, whenever I'm asking a question, uh, most of the time, it's um, it's a question because I am ignorant of it and I'm trying to gain information that makes me less ignorant of that particular thing. So these uncomfortable questions that you ask, uh, you have to be willing to ask them and to get the answers as well. That you, like you don't know where you're stepping into unknown territory by asking somebody a question because you don't know what the answer is ever going to be. Especially in this realm. We'll be studying some things that you may not agree with. And I want to make clear that wrong opinions are often a great pathway to the truth. Even studying wrong views when they're artfully expressed our, our struggle to try to understand why they're wrong and to work our way towards the truth can be immensely valuable. So I'm not choosing these books because everything they say validates what we know or everything they say is true. I'm choosing them because I think they have a singular way to make advances into reality. And that's partly, by the way, why we're using these great books, these teachers. I cannot do for you what Plato does. I want to give you a taste of what Plato does. I want to give you a taste of what Aristotle does with the books. I can't do that myself. Okay, so today's lecture, we begin with ancient philosophy. And by ancient philosophy, I'm going to limit our examination to two great ancient philosophers, Plato and Aristotle. In 1510, Raphael, the painter, was commissioned to do a series of paintings for the Vatican for a room that would be the entranceway to the Sistine Chapel. Maybe some of you have been there. There are a series of four paintings in that, uh, in that room. And one of the most famous paintings you may know, it's called the School of Athens. And in the School of Athens, there are all the great philosophers of the ancient world are there in different positions. It's wonderful to see Heraclitus and Parmenides and Euclid drawing out a, a shape with a compass. It's wonderful to see. But in the very center of the painting are two, and they reign over the School of Athens in a certain way. They are Plato and Aristotle, and they're in a conversation, and Plato is pointing up with a book under his arm, great books in philosophy, right? And Aristotle is pointing ahead. They're having a conversation, and above them is an arch, and then above the arch, above the painting, is an inscription which says, uh, causorum, cognitio knowledge of causes. That is to say, philosophy is about knowledge of causes, and we'll start more with this. Now, I like to think about Plato and Aristotle. There you go. Yes, knowledge is, of causes. Yes, this, this is a pure Aristotelian uh, approach to philosophy and to gain knowledge. So uh, he always said that uh, the true true knowledge, the, the best knowledge about the thing is to know the cause of the thing the thing. If you are you, if you know the cause of the thing, you know everything about this uh, thing. Yeah, that, that caught my ear right away. Cause and effect. Exactly. Definitely. We're on the right track right, right. away. So yeah. that you're talking here about the fundamentals of what you know as science and the scientific method, right? Well, these guys call it philosophy, the knowledge of the causes. Yep. It's even more fundamental than science, really. So these guys are talking about discussing those very basic concepts in Did the everybody mind. everybody get that? Yeah, did everybody get that? Because that's what struck me, Yeah, is the idea, the idea that science... You know, we hear science and, and philosophy and think that they're separate. And in this case, what this guy is positing, what he's suggesting, is that philosophy, at least as it's 
he's described it here by Aristotle is uh, is science. At yeah, least at some yeah. point early on, right? It is science. It's the, it's is the enlightenment, effect. isn't it? Yeah, but guys, this is this is amazing, bro. This is cause and effect of thought. That's what he's mm -hmm. saying. Exactly. Even yeah. in the thought process, you have to keep this logic of cause and effect. Yeah. Yes. 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 Beautiful. Yeah. That philosophy is pure logical, at least in Aristotle's approach, is just logical treaty. So whole organ, uh, including metaphysics, is pure logical uh, treaty. And San, San Thomas Aquinas also. Yeah. Again, this guy's just taken us on a journey at the beginning of this. Right? This is... When I first heard this, I said, this is us. This is what we should be doing. This is literally um, the places and the things that we should be talking about. Uh, not talking about um, ridiculous people looking at boats going over. Right? That's nothing to do with this. This is more... Um, intellect. It's all about how you process this information. Knowledge and, and when, causes. When, when, when Aristotle was contemplating these things, was he doing it based on someone else's thoughts and works, or was he coming up with this on his own? Well, we've led ourselves here to this point, right? right. Without knowing any of this. This is natural thought, right? The, the, what we're talking about here isn't something that somebody made up. Aristotle was the... Right, it, it agreed. It's not something that somebody made up, but as, as it relates to Aristotle, I think Aristotle... Correct me, Paper, because I think you've done a lot of research on this as well, your, your experience, but I think Aristotle was the first ancient call him philosopher, I'll call him scientist based on this particular conversation, right? To actually document that natural, logical causation kind of effect, right? I, I, that, that, I don't know that there was anyone before Aristotle that Aristotle said, hey, that was a really good point. Let me flesh that out. And everybody will talk about Aristotle. It, there may well have been. Euclid did um, the elements and Aristotle yes. did the mind, the thought. Right. Yeah, so, so there are these two, uh, let's say, treaties, uh, geometry and uh, organon. Uh, they are first well-known uh, uh, systematic uh, works because uh, many ph philosophers... W uh, had th thoughts, just thoughts or just uh, maybe syllogisms, uh, uh, simple syllogism or s some kind of th thoughts. But he, uh, Aristotle uh, first uh, and Euclid also at the same time, they li lived at the, at the same time, basically. Uh, so uh, they made systematic works uh, on that. So that's this is tr treaty on logic and geometry, uh, logic or philosophy <clears throat> rather. But uh, mm, of course uh, he mm, he was in opposition to many. Uh, he was just criticizing uh, predecessors. So uh, he didn't invent uh, mm, just new logic. Uh, it was there, but not not uh, in that uh, way, not in that systematic way. He put that in this systematic way because he was a doctor, he was a medicine man, and he uh, he studied m m many uh, things in biology. Whole systematics in biology is from him. So he he had that kind of mind. That he had to uh, to uh, to have everything in his mind in order, not just flying thoughts around. He had to know where to put 
uh, this folder goes here, this subfolder goes here. It has to be order. So yes, he was very, um, let's, uh, I don't know the English expression for, for one who is in full order. It has to be order. I like to say that, um, I like to think that Euclid was a group of people and they compiled all of the known knowledge into a systematic ordering process, like you say. And I think Aristotle is a similar sort of thing. All of those things were known, but Aristotle did a great way of putting them all together, much like Euclid did. Here's an order that you can follow and you can systematically understand this. Obviously, Aristotle's with the organon is a, a much bigger process because you're dealing with the mind and the ordering process of how the the mind works and so big an issue and all of that but we uh, euclid had a, an easier job right because euclid had the perfect the you know the stuff that can't be faulted whereas aristotle's dealing with I don't know, comprehension and all sorts of different issues. Similar sort of thing, though, putting it, everything together in a way that... But, I mean, it's not a full one, obviously. Aristotle can't put everything there, and he can't even uh, give you the way to comprehend and understand what he was going on about either. I can't... It's wrote in a really strange way, so you have to have a process of reasoning that goes with that i think you can't you can't just read the organ on can you and you could like you can't no. just read the elements you you have to go through that reasoning process and go over it backwards and forwards multiple times that's what it's designed to do make you think mm -hmm. But yeah. still, I, I think that, uh, Bev, you are wrong about Euclid, that the, the, it was not one person because, uh, mm, and Aristotle, mm, uh, because uh, I think that th this is extrapolation to our times, where basically uh, even uh, people which uh, who we are considering as wise, they are much dumber than uh people in the past mm. so i would say that uh, they they were real gen geniuses there I not think, only yeah. in, in ancient times but they were but uh, in that time uh, these geniuses were much more wise and skill skillful than uh, modern day geniuses i would say it may be uh, very difficult to imagine that but uh, let's, uh, you know, uh, in ancient times, uh, the, the youth, uh, young people, well educated, let's say, uh, they all knew, uh, for example, Homer and Hesiod, these, uh, these poems, great poems, very long poems. They are very thick books by heart, all. And it was norm. It was normal there. How, Funny how that can... you mentioned books, uh, paper, because most people think that a lot of people were able to read, right? But that's not the case. In most of ancient history, not the majority of the people did not know how to read. And around the time that you're talking about now, that's when the first time that a majority of people People were able to read and it was uh, usually the aristocrat arist uh, aristocracy that had that knowledge most people were not able to read yes but not in greek not in greek the in greek times uh, in uh, pericles times so uh, uh, in times of socrates and even before uh, this great democracy time pericles and cleon and this uh, um, Phidias uh, with this Acropolis, uh, etc. Uh, this was the time where in Greek all uh, could uh, read and write. 
So yes, no, this was the time when it started, like the majority, yeah, yeah a lot of people, yeah. yeah. But still, they they could uh, learn by heart these great poems. So uh, this is very rare. For for example, uh, we have in Poland this great, it's it's said epopea uh, from nineteenth century, and some sometimes I can I could hear uh, when I was very very young that this uh, lady. Uh, uh, eight years old, she knows this by heart, but it was very rare. But imagine that in that times, uh, every or nearly every uh, well-educated man uh, just knew that by heart, this this their lit literature. So uh, I would say that geniuses in the past were more skillful than uh, than uh, modern geniuses that uh, think that if they can click uh, fast in the keyboard they are geniuses but no it, it was i would say that uh, it it is extrapolation uh, so i just believe that this was one man aristotle who wrote that and euclid uh, not because he he invented everything, but uh, I think that uh, there were there were two of them, Aristotle and uh, and Euclid. And by the way, for example, Saint Thomas Aquinas, who wrote much much more than both of them, he wrote it on his own, and he died early. So he he died, uh, um, I think, overworked. Uh, when he was 50. So uh, he wrote his works uh, in like 20 uh, or yes, like 20 or maybe 30 years maximum. So 70 uh, tomes of, of his works. So I would say that single man can do that. But maybe now it is impossible because we have just a degraded, uh, uh, let's say, elite. So we, we can see that oh, this this guy is elite, but he is not very smart. But back in the day, it was. Uh, I would say that uh, these people were smarter, more intelligent, more memorable, and uh, just better educated and more hard working than uh, than today people that's that's me that's my opinion about aristotle and euclid etc are we right to carry on then sure okay okay aristotle as my two eyes Students always ask me, who do you like more, Plato or Aristotle? I like to say, that's like asking, which eye do you like better, your right eye or your left eye? Notice what your eyes do. You can see with one eye, but notice the depth perception you get with two eyes. I love both of these thinkers. They're both rich, and together they give us a sort of depth into reality. Now, uh, we're going to start with the Republic of Plato. That's a big book to begin with. It's ambitious. Uh, and before we get into Plato's Republic, uh, I want to notice a couple things. First of all, if you open Plato's Republic, uh, on the title page, uh, you see uh, a list of dramatis personae. That's remarkable. Dramatis personae, what is that? That is the persons of the drama. You may see dramatis personae when you read, say, a Shakespeare play. And that's the list of the persons in the drama. What? Is this a drama? Yes, it's a drama. It's written like a play, like a work of fiction. And then the first question you ask is, how is this a work of philosophy? I thought philosophy... Philosophy is about arguments and ideas. It's not about works of fiction. It's not about drama. It's not about poetry. Well, think again. That's why we start with Plato's Republic, because Plato only wrote dramatic dialogues. And one of our questions is going to be, why? Why does he embed 
his philosophy into drama. And we're going to try to answer that as we go along. I'm going to make hints to you, but it's a question I want you to think about. It may be that Plato is showing us the dramatic nature of the philosophical enterprise. We may have conceptions of what philosophy is. We may think that philosophy is a position of doubt in which you you press these abstract arguments and propositions until you arrive at some kind of certain knowledge or skepticism. But that's not the way Plato presents philosophy to us. So we want to read Plato with a great sensitivity to the drama of what's happening and not just extract the arguments out of the book and make them freestanding arguments. That's a mistake. I tell my students, Plato was not a Platonist. When philosophy is taught today, sometimes Plato is taught like a Platonist. We just take his ideas about the forms and about various abstractions and definitions, and we abstract them from the dramatic context, but I think that's a mistake. So we're looking at Plato integrating drama and philosophy. Important point. The guys just told you that Plato isn't a Platonist, which means that there are people that come after that take this work that Plato's doing here and change it into Platonists. They abstract all of the stuff that they decide out of the dramas that Plato's done. He's just a playwright. You could think of Plato as a playwright that's scripting certain things. Now, he could have seen these things. There could have been a guy called Play uh, Socrates. Or... There may not have been. There may have been somebody called Socrates that Plato heard about and he made up stories about what other people had told him. There's there's no real way to know. But what <laughs> this guy's just said is that um, Plato isn't a Platonist. So that means that somebody else has come along after the fact and interpreted... Plato to be something that Plato isn't, according to this guy. That's philosophy. That's interesting. Plato is not a Platonist. That's that's uh, quite a sentence there. It's worth taking on board, right? That, that yeah. all of this stuff is other people's interpretations of it. And you are only going to get out of this what you take out of it. Because this is you, like the your ideas are going to be what come from this. The things that we discuss are going to be the things that we take from it. It's not about these yeah, guys' words. It's about what we do. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And also what I was saying before about what I read yesterday, it's like logos, man. It's like no matter who says it, it doesn't matter. Right? Mm -hmm. It's you got to take that and interpret it in your brain and make sure it makes sense. Don't be influenced because his name is Einstein or Newton or Plato or Euclid for that matter. Shadow giants. Yes. They're all yes. shadow giants. Exactly. So is, uh, can I just read real quickly? Yeah, yeah. Uh, Pla Platonism? Go on. Just for those who don't know what it is, right? And this is this kills me. It's, this is from Wikipedia, but this kills me. So Platonism is the philosophy of Plato and philosophical systems closely derived from it. Though contemporary Platonists do not necessarily accept all doctrines of Plato. Plato. <laughs> okay. Imagine. So, yeah. <laughs> imagine. Imagine. So uh, in its most fun basic fundamentalist uh, fundamentals, sorry. Platonism affirms the existence of abstract objects which are asserted to exist in a third realm distinct from both the sensible external world and from the internal world of consciousness and is the opposite of nominalism. <laughs> I, I don't get any of that when I read Plato. So, I, right, so I'm totally on board with this guy. Plato was not a Platonist. So if anybody does research on Platonism, 
Um, I don't know where they got that from or how they got it, but well, it, it took some work to get there, I think. In the divided line, the mathematical objects do become abstract, right? They're beyond yeah, the physical realm. So yes. maybe that's what they're... So, but, I mean, it's a way of them taking that and putting it to the, an extreme rather than an idea or, you know, like it's... They, all of this is people putting into words something that they're trying to express as a thought process. Now, that's near impossible, but you can only get so close within grammar, logic and rhetoric in order to express that. And then whether somebody else misinterprets it or interprets it in a certain way, that that's what's happened with these Platonists. Yes, but Platonists and um, parapathetics, so uh, <laughs> there were two schools, so uh, they just developed uh, because uh, Plato uh, 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 said many things uh, in very vague uh, manner. Uh, so, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, it was unfinished, uh, not perfect, uh, not uh, not just closed system. Uh, so uh, they just uh, his school uh, of Platonists. They just developed uh, in many ways what what he said. So it was just development. So. Platonists were after Platon, and peripatetics were after Aristotle. There, there were, uh, there was a school of Aristotelian, uh, let's say, philosophers in Athens uh, all the time, uh, to to Roman times at least. I don't know if after, but uh, but they it was so. Yes, uh, Plato didn't uh, establish anything very, very fir firm, firmly. Uh, right. So, but, but still, uh, I think it is his thought that uh, original thought that uh, forms are existing outside of matter, and this is where uh, Aristotle uh, opposed uh, Plato because. Uh, mm, Aristotle's uh, thought was that we abstract uh, forms from matter, and uh, Plato said that no, uh, uh, we just induce forms into matter, because forms are in our mind, and we are inducing them into matter. So, quite opposite, uh, uh, did, let's say, Did he say that, though, knowledge. Plato? Because it, it, like he says, every all of his works, the entirety of Plato's works are done, and every one of them are uh, scripted like this. Yeah, yeah, they are but, dramatizations. Yeah. But but uh, I think that philosophical uh, system, th there is no original uh, system, coherent system of, of Plato. So like like Aristotle, Ar Aristotle yeah. was more. Systematic and more complete. Yeah, he, Plato wrote, he wrote it all down. Plato wrote him down in plays. So when you say Plato said this, um, did Plato ever script himself in a play or was he scripted somebody no. else to say that sort of thing? Mm. And We don't know. Yeah. It is ascribed to Plato. So we can see that uh, uh, we don't know what uh, his original thought was because if there are m multiple persons... Uh, in this drama, so sometimes we don't know uh, which side uh, Plato would take. I mean, he could have just been dictating everything that was going on, Plato. Could have just been Maybe. a little weirdy guy that was really good at dictating, <laughs> writing everything down, and then afterwards Maybe. made Maybe. a play about it. It right? be, yes. Yep. Uh, Benny actually asks, what were Plato's biggest achievements? Yeah, he was a, a playwright. He <laughs> yeah. was his... His, you know, he was a thinker and everybody calls him a philosopher or whatever, but it, I, I think historically what we know of Plato is that he was a playwright. He was the Shakespeare of his time. Is he... Yes, he, he wrote many dialogues. So yeah, that's, that's, oh. that's his achievements. And, and there's something very similar with, I mean, you could throw Shakespeare in there as well, I suppose, right? 
um, with with this kind of thing. Um, Jesus's parables, by the way, if you want to bring it back to something, you know, Christian Christianity, same kind of thing, right? There, yeah, when Jesus, Jesus, talked, Jesus it, didn't it, write them parables. down, right? He didn't Somebody write them else down. Wrote no, them his, down. his followers got, wrote them down. Yeah. yeah. So they but didn't the stories, get prescribed to his followers, did they? Like they did no. with Plato, right? Yeah, Plato's right. got, got the credit for everything. Yeah. It would be like Plato taking the credit for all of Jesus' yeah. parables. Yep, yep, yep. But it's the same, the allegories, right? It's like the story is, and I think that's what this guy talks about, right? It's the Platonist, and it, this guy is saying that the Platonist took the story element away from Plato's dramas and was left with whatever they created right this a abstract idea but there were abs there were there were or you can derive from plato's works things that are concrete concrete allegories or or concrete ideas from from that from his works same thing you can do with Jesus's parables. Same thing you could do from Shakespeare's plays, right? If you if you have ever read Hamlet or saw Hamlet as an example, right? There's things that you could take away from those. And I think what this guy is saying is there are a set of people, Platonists, who just just pulled the stuff out of the story and didn't bother with the actual story, the drama that happened. And there's important stuff in there that you may want to consider philosophically. Oh, yes. Yeah, there's, there's depth into the, the story, no doubt. It's really intricate. And for anybody to do that sort of work. But a little bit sus that there's nothing missing. There's a few of Euclid's stuff missing. Maybe, I don't know, is there an entire work of Aristotle? Did we get that? Or is there a few of them missing? I know for a fact that there are Euclid books missing. But not mm, one. I would say that there is treaty, uh, Aristotle's treaty um, uh, about soul. And it is uh, not preserved mm. to, I think... I'm not sure, but there is something that is missing from Aristotle. Yeah, strange that, that all of Plato's is there, yet yeah. not all of Euclid's and not all of Aristotle's, and there's no doubt loads of other works that are like that that didn't manage to survive. It goes back to John's sort of question at the beginning as well. This is uh, fundamental. There's no, nobody's documented it. And there have been other philosophers that have come on and attempted to revise it. But I don't know. I think you need to go over that and decide yourself how much yeah. any of this gets perverted by uh, the <laughs> mind, the human. Yeah. Revised it to the point of absolute meaningless in deconstructionism. Postmodernism. Eventually, yeah. postmodernism, yeah. yeah. Right, can we carry on? Okay. Yep. The second thing is that if you look at the dramatis personae that we just looked at in Plato's Republic, the first person listed there is named Socrates. Now, Socrates begins the dialogue and he speaks in the first person. And you need to know a little bit about Socrates if you don't know. And here is the salient points you need to know about Socrates. Socrates was condemned to death by the city of Athens in 399 BC. And he was accused of impiety. More specifically, he was accused of introducing false gods into the city and corrupting the young. That is a salient point that kind of looms over the whole history of philosophy. Why would the freest city, the most democratic city in the ancient world condemn to death a philosopher? Philosophy is a little bit like what C.S. Lewis says about Aslan in The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. Is he safe? Oh no, 
He's not safe, but he's good. That's how we have to think about philosophy here. It's not safe, and we need to understand why Plato argues that philosophy is not safe. Now, Plato's Republic is written, of course, after the death of Socrates, who is a teacher of Plato. And uh, that brings us then to the setting. And what I want to do is to cover three parts of this dialogue. Can't do the whole thing. I want to talk about the setting of the dialogue. I want to talk about the soul. And I want to talk about education. So those are the three things I want to cover. And then I have excerpts in the study guide that you can read about each of these. First, the setting of Plato's Republic. Might as well begin at the beginning. Socrates, I went down to the Piraeus yesterday with Glaucon, son of Ariston, to pray to the goddess. And at the same time, I wanted to observe how they would put on the festival since they were now holding it for the first time. Okay, several things to notice here, Socrates speaking. He goes down to the Piraeus. You would learn in a footnote, for example, in, in this book, is the Piraeus is the port city of Athens. It's the commercial center of Athens. And it was set apart from the city, and it was the place where foreign peoples would come to trade with Athenians. Socrates is with Glaucon. There's a friendship there. And when Socrates tells us that uh, Glaucon is the son of Ariston. He's telling us that Glaucon is the brother of Plato. Why does he go down to the Piraeus? To pray to the goddess and to observe the festival. He tells us they're putting on the festival for the first time. What we know from this passage is this. This is a new goddess being brought into the city from Thrace. It's a festival for a new goddess. Plato does not tell us this directly, but what he tells us in the very first line is this. There are already new gods being brought into the city of Athens. Socrates is not the one who introduces foreign gods into the city. They're already there. That's what he's telling us. Okay, I'm going to keep reading here. By the way, notice he goes to pray and to look on. There's a piety there. And there's also an interest in knowing. And there's a question I want to ask you. Are piety and the desire to know compatible with one another? It's a question to ask and we'll return to it. I'm continuing here into the next paragraph. Catching sight of us from afar as we were pressing homewards, Polemarchus, son of Cephalus, ordered his slave boy to run after us and order us to wait for him. The boy took hold of my cloak from behind and said, Polymarchus orders you to wait. What's happening here? Socrates is arrested. If you read the passage, Socrates is held. And Polymarchus tells him, you must stay with us here in the Piraeus and spend the evening with us. And Socrates says, well, won't you listen to me if I try to persuade you that I want to go back home? And Polymarchus says, do you see how many of us there are? Do you see how many of, of you there are? We are stronger and we won't listen. So make up your mind. What's Plato showing us? This is a prefiguring of the arrest of Socrates. It's a prefiguring of the whole political problem that leads to the death of Socrates. It's playful. Polemarchus isn't really arresting Socrates. The whole language is very playful. But if we're paying attention to the language and what's going on, what we see is that Plato wants to suggest to us, pay attention, this book is really about the defense of Socrates. Not the defense he makes in the dialogue called the Apology, where he has to defend himself before the assembly. And he says, I don't know how to speak to a whole assembly. Here's where he's with his friends. And Plato cues us every step along the way to show that there already are foreign gods in the city, number one. So Socrates is not the one who introduces them. The city, if introducing foreign gods makes a city decadent, it's already decadent. And number two, Socrates is not going around trying to corrupt the young. The, the young arrest him and draw, they're attracted to him. They draw him into the conversation. Now, Socrates obviously stays. And the question that's raised is the question of justice. That's how it begins. What is justice? And the background, of course, is, was it just for you to arrest me? 
and not listen to me make a case. Sometimes people will not listen to arguments. And that's maybe point number one. How do you do philosophy when people will not listen? How do we get ourselves into a position where we will listen to reason? And the Republic could then be regarded as a great book on the conditions for actually be being able to even do philosophy. What are the obstacles or blocks in our souls and the souls of others that prevent them from listening to reason? And how do we remove those blocks? How do we prepare people for that enterprise? Oh, there you go. How fucking poignant is that for us? I think you pretty much stated that there is no cop that is a philosopher. <laughs> <laughs> right? Yeah. Because, yeah. Under orders, right? Exactly. And, and by it, the way, it seems that that's the way, you know, the official structure is structured. To not listen and have no argument. Just do what you're ordered to do. Wow. wow. And by the way, he's talking also about uh, this motivation. Why, why Plato did his work in that manner because he has to be very cautious because uh, maybe uh, if he wouldn't be cautious <laughs> uh, he m might end like socrates yes so his vagueness is also uh, this let's say uh, not political correction maybe but but uh, just uh, awareness political awareness uh, that uh, he couldn't say uh, openly some things, so he just uh, uh, wrote it in that manner that you can interpret this way or that way, and this is not him. There are different persons, uh, so yes, I would say that he he was he was politically aware of a danger for philosopher. Here's here's a question. <laughs> just just that just uh, kind of hit me is so so P could plato also have been uh sort of instructing on what happens to people who might be in a position to question or behave like socrates behaved sending a message yeah kind of sending a message I would say yes, yes. I would say yes. Could he simply have been a playwright who wrote about the things of his time, like a Saturday Night Live, or a Lucas and a Spielberg? Well, you listen kind of to person. that. He does say that his brother was in that thing. He's he's close to it, or at least he's wrote himself into being close. He's. He's a student of Socrates, although I don't think he's ever mentioned as being a student of Socrates within this thing, within his own plays, although he's wrote his brother into that play. Could his brother, I mean, it leads to all sorts of questions, right? Yeah. Yes, he's right. Could his brother's character have been actually him? Yeah, who knows? <laughs> Could he have been someone else? In, yeah. in in his in his place right that's <laughs> it opens up all sorts of thoughts about this but it's still contemplating the ideas behind it is still valuable right without getting into plato's motives necessarily well yeah. the message is still there yeah mm -hmm. yeah definitely yeah yeah the message is that i think um don't ask questions right this is what you'll end up with and you'll you, when you see the story of uh, Socrates, he he literally just goes around asking questions and pointing out sophistry. And just one other thing, not related to what's being said, but the images are. are do we need to accept those images as actually being Socrates? No. Well, yeah, I mean, because you know, we, people don't talk about that very often. But that image does put an image in your brain. And mm -hmm. if you don't, you know, disregard it as, you know, being an actual image of the person, then, uh, 
you could a person will accept that as being the actual image. Just say, I just want to throw that out there. Yeah, nobody knows. It's what like the is. image of Christ. Is that what Christ looked mm -hmm. like? Yeah, I no have no idea because mm -hmm. you know there's a lot of rumors that he was a black man. Well, I mean, yeah, I mean it is easier because he is in in Greece, but I mean, what that means in those times, I don't know. Yeah. Okay, so the other amazing thing is that to notice is that it begins, as I said, with a question of justice. That's a question that we always have to deal with. It's a very human question. Should we raise taxes or lower taxes? Should we have uh, you know, subsidized health care or should we not subsidize health care? Should we allow abortion or not allow abortion? These are deep questions of justice that have to be answered. But what Plato shows us is that behind every particular concrete question of justice that we ask, if we push on it, it unfolds into a rich background of deep, deep questions. So philosophy is not the abstract thing that you do simply in your spare time. Plato shows us that philosophy naturally grows from our most basic, ordinary human concerns. If we stay with them, we are pushed back into those great questions, and he shows us how that happens. Okay, now just a little background as we turn to part, the second point I want to make about the soul. The way in which Socrates proposes to answer the question of justice is to create a city in speech. That's the, the city that this dialogue is named after, the Republic, the Politeia, the city in speech. And Socrates says, let's build a city in speech, and then we'll look at that city and see if we can find justice in it, because we really can't find, see justice in a soul. We can't see it inside people, it's invisible. But cities are made of people, so if there's justice in a soul, there's probably justice in a city somewhere. We see the city large, we find justice, and then we can go back and see it in the soul. So they build this magnificent city. And I just need to tell you how so I think that's a little bit weird as well. Personally, the way that they do construct that. I think it's a brilliant play and I really like it, but the idea of trying to find something in a soul and then comparing it to a, a city and then trying to put it back into the soul to compare the soul to a city. I don't know. It does. He, he works it very well. Whether it's just a way to, like he says, put it in words to tell a story. But I don't know. How else do you describe the soul? I wouldn't describe it by using a city. Yeah. Well, if you've, if you've never heard Republic, I mean, we are going to have to go into it. And because it is, it's fantastic so many bits that are well worth um going over fascinating oh meg how just rich and complicated and complex that city building is if i asked you to start from ground one and build up a city how would you do it so you need to see how socrates does this on your own but at a certain point uh they turn from the city to the soul and I want to make an observation about the soul that becomes very important. We are probably in the West, in America, accustomed, if we think about the soul at all, to think about the soul in terms of reason and passion as a duality in our soul. We see our desires pulling us one way, and we see our reason pulling us in a different way. And we experience that tension be between what we know is right and what our appetites are pulling us towards. And that's how we think about the drama of the human moral life. But Socrates actually wants to argue that the soul, there's a third part to the soul. And that third part he calls spiritedness. And he locates it in the chest. It is between our reason and our appetites. And to illustrate that there's this third part of the soul, he tells a little... Yeah, this is an important point. I think it might be in the notes or whatever, that what he's talking about here, this extra spiritedness, 
um, isn't present in modern philosophy. They've done away with it. It's just those other two considered modern. So this is an old school part that he's talking about here. They've just done away with. A story which I'm going to read to you. I once heard something that I trust. Leontius, the son of Aglion, was going up from the Piraeus under the outside of the north wall when he noticed corpses lying by the public executioner. He desired to look, but at the same time, he was disgusted and made himself turn away. And for a while, he struggled and covered his face, but finally, overpowered by the desire, he opened his eyes wide, ran toward the corpses, and said, Look, you damned wretches, take your fill of the fair sight. Okay, what does that story do for us? So we imagine Leontius. I just want you to talk about that story. Talk, talk about it among yourselves if you have a book group. Like, what is going on in that story? First of all, you could ask, what's wrong with looking at corpses? Is that wrong? Doctors look at corpses. Morticians look at corpses. They do autopsies. Is it wrong to look at a dead body? And why is Leontius then so troubled by this looking at a corpse? It may be that there are kinds of looking. That looking at a corpse is not a simple thing. Notice that he says that he wanted to look in part because he uh -oh. was disgusted. Socrates is alerting us to two ways of knowing, richly. A way that the medieval tradition calls studiositas and curiositas. Curiositas, we use that word curiosity for a love of learning, but Thomas Aquinas, for example, thought curiosity was a vice. Curiositas is a perverse desire to know. What? Could there be a perverse desire to know? We Americans think all desire to know is good, but let's think about it. Are there not perhaps perverse ways in which we look not to know, but to be titillated? Could it be that what Leontius really wants is not to learn about the corpse. What he really wants is a kind of passionate spectacle inside him, to have the experience of being disgusted, to being shocked. It's an obscene desire. It's a depersonalized desire. It's not genuinely a desire to know. So Socrates points us towards studiositas, a desire that's focused on the object that really wants to not just be titillated by looking at a grotesque thing, but to actually learn and enrich our knowledge of some reality. He points us to that. By the way, that, that means then that philosophy is going to be an ethical enterprise. Fundamentally, our, our ethical disposition is going to shape how we see. Now, this is located in this spiritedness that Socrates gives us. And notice that this spiritedness is not the desire to know, and it's not the appetite or the disgust, it's that moral center. It's the moral center in Leontius, which, which first tells him, don't look as a moral center, and then expresses anger with him for looking. Have your fill, you filthy wretches at the fair sight, right? He's angry at his eyes. And that anger is a regulatory, it's a moral regulation of of how we conduct ourselves. So we're gonna really wanna pay attention to that. And that leads me to my third and last point. Point out here. Um, to me, a lot of things relate to uh, the situation that we're in. And uh, that sounds a lot like uh, a group of people that go around just to ridicule people, right? They, they say that they're there um, only for uh, ridicule. They they have no purpose other than that to be uh, in the arena, whereas other people are actually looking to find um, answers, causes of certain things. Yes, so 
but they say they they are here only for le for learning. Yeah. But it turns out that they are only for mocking. And by the way, this third part, uh, it is uh, it's called conscious, I think, mm. in English. So this spiritual, the, the, this our inner compass, because uh, uh, he was uh, talking about this something inside us, who what uh, is is saying, don't look at corpses, because uh, you are not uh, looking at them because of. Uh, this is studiositas, this, uh, to study, to learn anything, but just to, to sate your appetite, the sick appetite. Mm. So this, this is, I would say, conscious is telling us, don't do that. But he uh, over, overcame this, uh, yeah. this consciousness, uh, this conscious uh, warning, and he looked. So... I would yeah. say that, that, that the word would be co conscious. Happens all the time uh, with um, accidents on the roadway, especially here in America. Mm -hmm. Right? If there's an accident, everyone has to slow down and look. It's like, what are you looking at? Are you looking at, looking for the blood on the ground? Are you looking for someone's limb to be sitting over there? Someone to be, you know, Lord knows what, right? Yeah. What do you but gain everybody has from to it? Look. What do you gain from it? Mm -hmm. Exactly. <laughs> Can I get Kevin? Did you ever watch a golf tournament? Oh yes, yeah, I've been to golf. Tournament. When the guy hits the ball in the rough or something, why do a group of people gather around and look at the ball? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I never understood that. <laughs> why do they do that? It makes yeah. no sense. What kind of curiosity? I don't even understand the curiosity. The cur there you go. It's it's that right. It's the human psyche. Just here yeah. for the train wreck. It's all, you know, no, no, no pun intended with <laughs> stuff in America with the trains. Oh, um, but yeah, just here for the train wreck. Yeah. Yeah, that does. It sounded for as soon as I heard that one. And that is like, that's a little passage about a story that he added in that they heard about something else. It's a story that's told. Uh, with a message. What the message is. I guess. But like. You can read books like this. And if you were to pick apart. Each place. And because somebody's given Plato. The, uh, um, the idea of some sort of a philosopher. Then it gives other people. Chance to read into the words. That are put in here. And all really it does is it conjures up thoughts in other people. Now, if that's what a philosopher does, helps other people think a bit. I don't know. Like It's up to the person to study these works from Plato. If you don't do that, then what do you gain from uh, Plato? Do you just take other people's words for it? Or can other people interpret it better than you can? It's... Uh... That if philosophy is, a, is fundamentally a moral enterprise, or it involves a moral disposition, if our passions and emotions condition how we see reality, then it matters a lot how we educate those. And a huge part of Plato's Republic is on education. So this brings me to my third point. One of the questions Socrates asks is, how are people in this city going to be educated? And we have in this book an incredibly rich meditation on education. He says, let's be like men telling tales in a tale and at their leisure, let's educate these men in speech. What is the education? Isn't it difficult to find a better one than that discovered over a great expanse of time? It is, of course, gymnastic for bodies and music 
for the soul. Music, the most important education for Plato, foundationally, is music. Now, I want you to ask your... You see what he did there? Most foundationally for Plato. So now it's Plato's work, not the scripted thing that he's wrote for somebody else. It's for Plato. Yourself, whether that makes sense. Would that have been your answer? If I asked you, what do you think is the, the most important foundational education you can give someone? Would you have said music? But Plato thought so. He says, don't you know that the beginning is the most important part of every work and that this is especially so with anything young and tender? For at that stage, it's most plastic, and each thing assimilates itself to the model whose stamp it and wishes to give it. What Do you hear that? I think this is an instruction book. You might just go, can you go back on that a little bit? Let me listen to that again, Bev. Okay. Condition how we see reality, then it matters a lot how we educate those. And a huge part of Plato's Republic is on education. So this brings me to my third point. One of the questions Socrates asks is, how are people in this city going to be educated? And we have in this book an incredibly rich meditation on education. He says, let's be like men telling tales in a tale and at their leisure... Let's educate these men in speech. What is the education? Isn't it difficult to find a better one than that discovered over a great expanse of time? It is, of course, gymnastic for bodies and music for the soul. Music, the most important education for Plato, foundationally, is music. Now, I want you to ask yourself, whether that makes sense, would that have been your answer if I asked you? Does it make sense? It's a good question to ask yourself. Does it make sense that Plato says the best education for the soul is music? Right? But then listen to this. This is, this is the bit now. What do you think is the, the most important... Sorry, say that again. I'm sorry, I was just wondering, does he mean the theory or or the actual music itself? Uh, 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 it's to do with muses. Okay, okay. Right, but this is the important part. Foundational education you can give someone, would you have said music? But Plato thought so. He says, Listen. Don't you know that the beginning is the most important part of every work, and that this is especially so with anything young and tender? For at that stage, it's most plastic, and each thing assimilates itself to the model whose stamp it and wishes to give it. Mm-hmm. Wow. Don't Dad, you know wait, that the wait, beginning wait, wait, wait. is the question. most important part of every work? What's the work? Uh, and this is especially okay. so with anything young and tender. Um, talking about the mind... Or is he talking yeah. about educating people? No. Says he was that talking that <clears throat> young people are more most sensible and um, uh, susceptible. Or, or the formulation of an idea. Yes. So it, so can it be is. Yep. Yes, it is called formation. Mm -hmm. Formation of the mind. But what yeah, he so says, are, plastic. So, so you can form. The yeah. mind. Well, that, at that stage, it is most plastic. And each thing assimilates itself to the model whose stamp anyone mm -hmm. wishes to give it. So at the yeah. formulation of any sort of idea, any conversation that you're having, right at the start of it, if somebody injects a model, um, that's why you can't get traction. Because somebody else has stamped a model on it. Rob Keane, you had a question? Yes, how are you, Rob? Are 
Be there, you, Rob. Rob. We'll come back. To okay, yeah. So I think that's pretty important. It's particularly it where we are and for education purposes. Um, particularly the model in which gets stamped once you once you learn a bit more about um the formulation of ideas, it gets hard to get rid of this. Once that plastic thing sets once it's it not becomes, as modable. Yeah, yeah. But at least we can say that uh, Plato knew why education is so important. Yes. Yes. And and you can you can actually comport this to many other things, right? The concept of it. It could be a child. As Bev said, it could be an idea, right? The every work. It could be an idea. An argument. Young and an argument, young and tender. It could it could be a plant. Mm -hmm. Anybody that's seen how bonsai plants are created, the the way that you trim and hold back certain parts of a plant or not, or right. It, it it's it's axiomatic. This is just axiomatic. Yeah. That's why they want the children at four years old. Mm. Yeah. It or does carry on. Earlier. It is it or is more earlier. about children, yeah, yeah. I don't know whether he can continues with it. But yeah, this is about this is about how you educate people, and the, the, like he says, there is a lot of this stuff within this um, book. Talking about educating the children, but this is Plato. It's, it, so many levels of. He gets away with saying it's somebody else by writing it into a thing, but it is Plato that's actually writing it. What about music then? What does he mean by music at the beginning? He doesn't mean simply melody or harmony. He means any work inspired by the muses. That is, he means works of art. That's what he's talking about here. And where does he begin the works of art? With stories. He says, let's tell tales. The word in Greek for tale is muthos. It means myth. The word for speech is logos. We're going to have speech about myth. He says, they have to be educated first in the false tales and in the true tales. That's also disarming. I'm not going <laughs> to... First, they have to be That's taught great. the false tales. I mean, no way. Yes, way. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, that's the way it works. That's what this book's about. This is a script. This is a, a playbook. This is how you do it, I think. Hidden within a philosophical thing. <laughs> Teach my kid false tales. What parent begins educating their children with false tales. Hopefully, all of you. You read your children Aesop's fables, I hope. You read them the Chronicles of Narnia. You read them stories that you love. Are they false? Yes, in a literal sense, they're false, but they may be morally and metaphysically true. Socrates believes that the, the stories we tell our children are foundational for how they see the world. And he further... It's Socrates now again. <laughs> He's just swapped it to Socrates. Not, not Plato anymore. Yeah. I mean, that's clever, isn't it? I don't know whether he's noticed he's doing that. So he's swapping it from one to the other. To swap, I don't know. What do you guys, what do you guys I want to get a, a, a sense. What do you guys think of that concept? That children are taught, not necessarily untruths, but fictions. Very, very early. Specifically taught falsehoods, he said, didn't he? Mm hmm. He, that's what he said. Yeah. It's important to do that. Did he give a purpose? No. 
educational. Yeah. <laughs> He's made that statement as part of the education that they need to be taught falsehood. Yeah, he's probably going to explain it, but I mean, what do you think about it before that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, before he goes on to explain. I mean, he mentions Aesop's fables, right? One might put Jesus' parables in there. But, I mean, is the instructor explaining to the students that this is a falsehood, and I'm teaching you this falsehood in order so you can use it in the future to compare it to truths? I, I, you know, or, yeah. I need more context, I guess. Yeah. It depends how it's taught, isn't it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, and also the, the knowing, right, that you can be told falsehoods that are obvious falsehoods, but um, if within your paracosm that you've built, you've built a framework of falsehoods, uh, could you incorporate within your paracosm these falsehoods to carry on into the rest of your life. But I still don't assume that he was talking about uh, he was talking about stories about uh, not maybe real people, but realistic. So uh, the, the stories that could happen. Uh, not impossible stories mm. like now Star Wars, I think. Yeah, I don't least. think they had that back then, did they? Or did would they have had uh, Aslan? They may have had the their own. Yeah, well, that was. Well, they have the Iliad, don't they? The I guess you could call yes. that. Yes, absolutely. But would that have been taught as uh, true, Homer? You know, is that? Mm. Don't I would know. say that this is uh, this is what he called myth. Mm. So, uh, oh. not not tr really a true story, mm -hmm. but uh, but but with moral, let's say, sense. There so you go. What he how, said. how about the, the boy who cried wolf? Right. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, that story. Yes, yeah, some some kind of story, not about maybe real person, but uh, to learn m m to moral from from that story. Mm -hmm. I would say that. You see how there's, there, but but there's also the motivation behind it, right? You could see how one could listen to this, and and extract an evil from it as well as extract a good from it, right? This is like the evil would be, well, I'm going to purposely from a very young age tell you a falsehood to make sure that you adopt a model that I know is incorrect and is going to warp your thinking for the rest of your life. Probably evil, right? Not good for sure. Or I'm going to tell you a story that's not true because behind it is a moral imperative that you need to learn because it's going to be beneficial to you for the rest of your life. How does one know the difference? Mm, at first glance, I would say that you cannot uh, distinct between the two. But uh, so, yes, people <clears throat> can hide intention. I would say that this is about intention. Because small children, anyway, will believe you. Mm -hmm. So it is on you. The moral responsibility, uh, what and why and how you are telling the story or whatever, is on you, not on the listener being a small child. That's me. Major sin lying to the children, in my opinion. Yeah, but like they say, there is a there's a a way of getting around that within the words in this, isn't there? And there's a way of abusing it. Mm -hmm. That's down to the individual and how you deal with it. I think it's just it's interesting in the way that you can. Mm, discuss this with these within these words and how they can be changed 
But the point that I was trying to make there really is the, the fact that the model, they, they they know that you can place a model within yep. a young child. You can mould them with the plastic. It even says it's plastic, it's mouldable. You can shape this. Thought of people like you can do it of adults as well. It's yes, you can. If you get in the right time, early on enough in the conception of it, I think that's what we're going to be dealing with. The problem is that there are a group of people out there that don't want people to get a good footing on logic, and they don't want people to start thinking for themselves. So they will be. Um, telling everybody that you don't know about logic and you're not doing it right and whatever, but it's again like it it's with a within the individual to take me, this on. So this brought up just just brought up something in my mind. It's it, uh, so I'm a big movie guy, right? So I I don't know how many people have are going to get this metaphor, but has anyone else seen the movie Dune? Not the most recent one, but the original one back in the um, 80s yeah but i won't remember it okay so there's a there's a scene in there where the uh hero is being tested by this this uh priestess and part of the test is he puts his hand in this box and in in the box it's she's somehow either used a chemical or done some sort of hypnosis on him that says your hand is burning like it's in in a fire searing you can feel your flesh peeling away that kind of thing right and he goes through this thing where he says fear is the mind killer fear is the mind killer right and so just just on the point that bev just made about you know this th this thing can be done to adults absolutely to me the easiest way to do that is through fear absolutely right fear porn the fear porn you want to mold people change people it turn them into children how do you turn them into children fear is one of the easiest way to turn them into children and then they'll just look for guidance mm -hmm. and that particular thing that particular model of people looking for guidance when they get fearful can have been set into them at childhood Yep. It's an automatic reaction that you're not really in control of. You've been molded. And everybody has this chance, right? It's within everyone. Nobody's specific away from this sort of stuff. It can happen to anyone and everyone. Probably has. Yeah, but this kind of education is just pure uh, ideology. It's like in communistic uh, countries, uh, uh, people were learned, were taught from from early childhood that party is good. Mm -hmm. So, re uh, or just Soviet Union is good, and everything uh, connected with that is good. And the the most uh, let's say popular uh, journal uh, there was uh, the truth, yes, Pravda, the, the, the most uh, well known uh, I think in the world. Uh, if you don't know, it was uh, the journal. What which title was the truth in Soviet Union? So. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Did you know that or not? No, I didn't know that. Yeah, the, the yeah, truth. yeah. It, yep. In Russian, pravda. So it is the truth. Mm -hmm. So this is most popular journal. There was. Maybe it still exists now. So. Yeah. Interesting. We're ready to go on. You? Isn't it near the, uh, near the end? tells us one. in a section that we're not going to discuss right now that the tales that the Greeks have been told about the gods are false tales. Do we want to start by telling our children that the gods commit incest? Do we want to start with tales about the gods murdering their fathers, castrating their fathers, 
fighting with one another? Are those the kinds of stories about the highest beings with which we want to form our own children? Socrates says, no. And now we see the grounds of his impiety here. Yes, he sees that the tales that are told in Athens are false tales and harmful tales. And so the key is to find true tales for them. That's a great part of Plato's Republic. But I'm going to bring you to my last point. It's not just the tales that matter. It's how the tales are told. I've got teenagers. You know how the conversation goes. I, I don't listen to the lyrics. I just love the melody. That's one way the conversation goes. But the lyrics matter. Or the lyrics are great. I know it's death metal, but they're Christian lyrics. And the disconnect, as a parent, we often feel there, that doesn't seem quite right to be singing Christian lyrics to death metal music. Socrates thinks the melody and harmony and the lyrics all shape our soul profoundly. And so we have to pay attention to that. And here's the quote I promised to read you. This is the same passage that C.S. Lewis cites, and I'm going to leave you with this passage after I say a word about it. So Glaucon, I said, isn't this why the rearing in music is most sovereign? Because rhythm and harmony, most of all, insinuate themselves into the innermost part of the soul and most vigorously lay hold of it. We know that, don't we? We all love music. Why do we? We know it lays hold of the innermost soul. It brings with them either grace, if they're properly reared, or it's opposite. We know how music moves us. I sometimes ask my students, uh, why do they play music before football games? When's the last time you heard the loudspeaker play uh, you know, Beethoven's Fifth Symphony before the football game? Why do they always choose something like Guns N' Roses? Just think about it. Furthermore, Music is sovereign because the man properly reared on rhythm and harmony would have the sharpest sense for what's been left out and what isn't a fine product of craft and what isn't a fine product of nature. And due to his having the right kind of dislikes, he would praise the fine things and taking pleasure in them and receiving them into his soul, he would be reared on them and become a gentleman. He would blame and hate the ugly in the right way and while he's still young before he's able to grasp reasonable speech, logos. And when reasonable speech comes, the man who's reared in this way would take most delight in it, recognizing it on its account of being akin. Here's the point. Poetry education is the foundation for philosophy education. Why is that? Because knowing and the human being always involves a kind of emotional coefficient. Our emotions are not just uh, forces in us. They have a kind of preparation in us for knowing and recognizing reality. So Socrates' argument is that if we're not shaped in our imaginative and emotional lives, prepared to recognize what's true, good, and beautiful, then the philosophical life is going to not succeed, and it might fail miserably. Okay, I've not talked about philosophy yet, and this is a great books course on philosophy. Get ready, it's coming in the next lecture. Right, I have to go back to that bit there. Uh. My last point goes, it's a great to shape Lewis. Rhythm and harmony, most of all, insinuate themselves Music and sovereign elves into the innermost part of the soul and most vigorously lay hold of it. We know that, don't we? We all love music. Why opposite? We know how music moves us. I sometimes ask my students, uh, why do they play music before for music is sovereign because the man properly reared on rhythm and harmony would have the sharpest sense for what's been left out and what isn't a fine product of craft, and what isn't a fine product of nature. And due to his having the right kind of dislikes, he would praise the fine things 
and taking pleasure in them and receiving them into his soul, he would be reared on them and become a gentleman. He would blame and hate the ugly in the right way and while he's still young before he's able to grasp reasonable speech. Right. That's an important point. He's talking about the, the children. At what point can you develop reasonable speech? When does reasonable speech come? Not for a while. Reasoned speech? Probably, shoo, man, maybe, maybe some can argue maybe never. Yeah, that's the point, right? <laughs> right like at at right? what point, if you've it's not certainly... been bred or been brought up in a way, then I, I don't think you're able to have or comprehend reasonable speech. That may be the problem that we have. I would say that uh, reasonable speech uh, okay, manifests uh, where um, you can express not only what you see or, or what you feel, but what you think. So if child yeah. is talking about his own thinking, then we can say that he uh, has uh, this reasonable speech because uh, without it, he wouldn't be able to express that. So uh, if he is talking about his thoughts, it means that at least he started to have this uh, reasonable speech, which is a process, of course, but I would say that that would be uh, a sign of that. A sign of hearing somebody else talk about their thoughts. Yes, when he is talking about his thoughts, yes. Not like, I think you're stupid. No, no, no. That's the thoughts. <laughs> thoughts. <laughs> not, I, I yeah. was not talking about judging anyone, yeah, yeah. but thoughts. I mean, well, I, what's the difference between a reasonable speech and a reasoned speech? Yeah, I, I don't... I don't know that there is a difference. I, I, I th it says here in the text that he's reading reasonable speech. I think that that actually means reasoned speech, which is what paper is getting at. Like mm -hmm. the ability to reason in your mind and then use your speech to be able to articulate what's in your mind. Like a, even a three or four year old that's talking can't do that. Right. All they can do is hopefully be able to say what they want or like paper said, feel like I don't feel good, mommy. Right. Whatever, whatever those those kinds of things are. But we're not talking about that. We're talking about actually being able to reason. To think through a thought, be able to articulate that thought in such a way to make someone else understand what your what that thought was. That's that's being able to reason. Yeah, it says the man who's reared, like he says, the man, mm -hmm. right? So yeah. he's talking about reasonable speech and then the man. So really, the reason speech doesn't come as a child. It comes as a man. Mm -hmm. And it says the man who's reared in this way would take most delight in it, recognizing it on account of its being akin I have to thank Raven. He's talking about kinds. He's talking about relating this process, this reasonable speech is the reasoned, the the mental part that comes along with the talking, right? He's, he's being able to show the mental part of the conversation and show you to be able to show you, like Paper said, about the thoughts, that's the reasonable part of it, that he's able to express it in a way but that it makes is, sense. Yeah, but it is. So here, let me, again, I, so I'm seeing both sides, like like the two sides of a coin here. Oh, sorry, Skeptical, go ahead. No, go ahead. Just finish your point. No, no, it's going to be a longer point, so you go, you go first. No, because my question is, when... Can I say that a person is reasonable? 
I don't. They're not talking about reasonable. They're talking about the the act of reasoning and yes, making a reasonable, um, being able to reason that talk and present it to somebody else within yes, speech. So he, he, yes, yes, he was talking about speech. So uh, exactly. it would Speaker. be a manifestation of uh, or sign of that that you, you, you can think. Because uh, if you don't speak, uh, nobody knows if you are thinking or not. But if you can reasonably uh, uh, speak, this is a manifestation of your thought somehow. You're likely going to be a young adult, is my guess, skeptical at best. <laughs> but and then fact, maybe not even then. But he's talking about education before. Yeah, so, so this music is before. Yes. And that's what I want to get to, right? That and the two sides of the coin, hang on a paper, the two sides of the coin for me are this, right? One side of the coin is the uh, get the music, right? The the muses, he said, appeals to the emotion, right? That's what you can get before reasonable speech. You can you can feel the emotion. And, and that emotion can be either good or bad. He used the example of Guns N' Roses. For those of you who don't know, that's an American heavy metal band from the, uh, from the 80s and the 90s. Okay? So not what you, what you would think of as like Beethoven or classical music. Very, 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 very different. But, but you, can, you can either way, music drives emotion. And he also mentions poetry. Right. He says poetry is the foundation of philosophy. Well, poetry is another thing. Drama, poetry that evokes emotion. So I think the the two sides of the coin here are emotion as something that drives your reason. Or maybe not. I don't know. And using emotion, because that's what comes first in a in a in a human being is the emotions will come before the ability to have reason speech. That's why I'll if, see a, I'm sorry, yeah. I'm just, I just want to say that's why I'll see a child start dancing to music before they even start talking. Yes. Yes, absolutely. So, so, but what about that, right? Do you, is that a good thing to have emotions drive that or being the foundation before reasonable speech? Because what can emotions yes. do, right? Uh, I would say that uh, it is important <clears throat> what music you are hearing mm. or you, you are listening to. So uh, it's not just the music, he, though. He's the muses. Right? He's talking the about all of the because, arts, isn't he? Yes, yes, yes. But it has to be, uh, let's say, some kind of that sort because uh, you, you can uh, use even uh, this muses in bad way or good way mm -hmm. so uh, so it means that your feelings your this education before reasoning should uh, uh, lead you into thinking but the, you can use that music so so this is uh, this example with the guns and roses which are rather distracting so if you are uh, educated, let's say, on that kind of music, uh, like this uh, trash metal or whatever, I, I don't call it even music. For me, this is just <laughs> psychological disaster. Noise. Yeah, yeah. Right. <laughs> so, so, so making the, this kind of uh, noise for, for children, it, it cannot... Uh, and well for the focusing the mind because it's just uh, quite opposite. So it, and, it and is... don't forget those sounds affect water and the structure of water, and we're made of water. Yes. So, you know the different sounds that are being inputted in uh, are, are creating probably a different individual based yeah. on the structure. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. Not, not just sounds though either. The visuals, right? Things that young children the sounds see. come first though. Yes. Before, yeah. Yep. Absolutely. But then, what they see and what they experience 
from from that because remember he does say all of the arts right so, all of them so, right yeah that uh, in our day and a day and age that would include entertainment what they're putting into their minds through their tablets the smartphones the television etc cetera, etc cetera, right what's go what's going in there that's driving them emotionally is the right? music well it's the art I, mm -hmm. could i put in the yeah, idea yeah. that that i think thank raven again is this not the formulation of the trivium to say that you know there's a a part of learning that is done early in the you know, formulation of the mind and then at a certain time you become ready to formulate these ideas into rhetoric right the the formulation of the grammar the logic the rhetoric makes a man that is able to do this oh. i think well you know my my opinion on that i think that's true what i'm struggling with and not really struggling what what interests me in, in what this guy has just been talking about is if if poetry as he put it poetry and music the arts if that's the foundation for philosophy then it's important for each person that that starts down the path of philosophy to understand what drives them emotionally, right? Yes, At least go into it with your eyes wide open. That that and there's a good side to emotions because it can drive you in a good way, and there's a bad side to emotions. It can drive you to a, a more destructive thing, right? I am Kevin. I am with you because uh, it is uh, in the theory of music uh, because. Uh, of course, Greeks uh, had uh, this ancient Greek scales, like Dorian, like uh, Aeolian scale, uh, whatever. Mm -hmm. And uh, Plato uh, was uh, had opinion that some scales are good and some scales are bad. And he forbade some scales because he thought that these scales will be not good. So I think that he is talking about this kind of thing that what music uh, should be learned uh, in order to prepare uh, good feelings for better education, let's say uh, thoughtful education. So mm. I, I would say that this is what he is talking about here, I think. So, in other words, if you're emotionally receptive, you'll also be mentally receptive in a comfortable state. I see what you're saying, Paper. I agree. Yeah. So, 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 just uh, uh, that music prepares. Sure. Uh, muses prepares, uh, and you can prepare uh, with bad music or good music, and he. Uh, mm -hmm. Mm. order it to to use that scales and not those scales because those are bad and these are good so i was uh, learning about that uh, in school about this ancient scales so it it was known for for, for me that some are, were bad and some were good i i think just to cap it off for me, I would say the emotional state of the learner at a very young age, I think, will determine the kind of philosophy that that human being is likely to adopt. Doesn't mean it has to be necessarily, I guess, but I, I think the emotional state that that early, that young human being is in will help determine what kind of philosophy they end up adopting because it always intrigued me especially with the quote modern philosophers today the deconstructionists the postmodernists right and how they could get to the point where they get to like again to use the example of well sure a man can be a woman and and a man can have a period you know and a man could give birth to a baby right those kinds of things and that and be okay with that that that's that that's my philosophy, 
right? No. What what has to happen to that person emotionally? What kind of emotional state oh. must they have been in at some point? Yes, and people were prepared. You remember this film with Ar Ar Arnie Arnold Schwarzenegger, where he yes. he was bearing as some yeah. child allegedly. So mm -hmm. this is just ideological and yes pre preparation. So the audience was already pre prepared. So it was Emotionally just prepared. pushing some agenda yeah. in in media. Yes, simple. Yeah. That's, again, all cautionary stuff, right? Not that this guy's pushing that necessarily. I think it's I think it's good. I think even looking at Plato, personally, I'm not sure that, that po as he says, poetry is the foundation of philosophy. I, I kind of, uh, the way that I interpret it, the good that I take out of it, right? Take, take what you like and leave the rest, as I said, one of my mentors said, or as John said, take what you need and leave the rest. The part that I take out of what he said is understanding the emotional state, right? Understanding what emotional state you're coming from before you're able to reason, right? And that's why so many people in this arena that we've dealt with, they're so afraid of what might happen if they let go of globe. Just to be <laughs> just right, just to be in this arena. Because we're moving out of this arena, it's just a microcosm of the human condition and the human psyche. But but it's good for this illustrative purpose, right? They're so afraid of what that might be, no globe, that they lose all reason when it comes to things that can actually be proven in reality, and then hate you for it. And again, the emotion comes right back around and whips you, and they hate you for it. Well, they hate Bev for it. Right. I mean, <laughs> right. That there you go. So, yeah, it's I, at least eyes wide open that emotion can play into philosophy that can then play into emotion that can just be a vicious circle, just a vicious circle of total destruction, potentially. MK Ultra. Maybe. Right. I think that's a bit strange, that particular passage as well. Because um, it was my understanding that they didn't like the poets. Yeah, mine as well, right? They considered that a form of uh, sophistry, you know, mm -hmm. just sort of playing with words, with the identity of the words, making the words more flowery. Yes, right. and so that was just psychological operation. Mm. So... Uh, uh, no logic, like for example, this uh, Iliad or uh, or Hesiod, this Theo Theogonia. So the, the, there were some works. Like he said, works. lies, right? Do you want to teach your children the lies, and these are lies? But they are very, very, uh, let's say, sophisticated as an art of poetry. Mm -hmm. this, this was very. Uh, sophisticated I, I learned that uh, in university how uh, these rhymes uh, or rather rhythms were uh, created they, they were very uh, specific and complicated ways of creating uh, poems uh, in Greek because uh, this is melody of that so uh, it, it is strictly re related to music Mm. Because we uh, know that uh, poetry, as we know today, it, there are uh, just rhymes that we have endings of the of the verse, and it has to match the syllabs, uh, ha has to match the the other, and then we have poem in in um, ancient Greek uh, times and Roman times also because Romans adopted uh, poetry from Greek, uh, it was completely different. So w w you you have melody, for example, two uh, sh uh, it, it is dependent on l longitude of uh, vowels and uh, uh, what's the name? Semivocal or uh, consonant. So uh, uh, some syllabs are longer and some are shorter. So you, you can produce a rhythm with that. 
ta 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 ti da da ta 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 almost ta 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 ti da 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 ta 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 so uh, you you can produce some rhythmic uh, mm, uh, pattern in that and they the, uh, they they did so there there were many uh, with strict rules uh, how to uh, to to make this poetry so whole poetry is uh, produced in ancient times uh, like like that so uh, it is strictly re related to music or a rhythmic part of music so uh, so just just to to, to explain what what means poetry in in ancient times Some, yeah. something different mm. than could, than now could you could you say that music and poetry the arts right just the arts in general could you say that they might be the um, the corpses that Plato talked about with the one guy that didn't want to look on the corpses, and that you could you could either look at the arts as a spectacle to look at because your greedy little eyes want to look upon the skept the, the spectacle, right, and and entertain it for your own morbid personal reasons or that there's something instructive about it right that there's there could be something instructive about what actually happened and you're looking at the scene not because it's gory and you want to see it and it's it's and it's all all of its morbidity but there's something that you can learn from it is that a possibility when you think about the arts the music the poetry put and, it and akin kind of to the one of uh, plato's plays right you put it akin to the republic and mm -hmm. say the Republic is a work of art, mm -hmm. so that you could you place that the very book that he's talking about within the art that he's talking about within that thing. Yeah, mm, maybe I didn't think about that in that way, but still, uh, uh, th this poetry uh, was very important psychological part of education. Mm -hmm. and, I would uh, say it still is, right? But is it? Yes. Can yes. you say it's good or bad, right? That's the thing, right? Same with music, right? How how does anyone know if it's good or bad? How does anyone know that certain poetry is good or bad, or certain entertainment is good or bad? You I, do know with the music, right? You know when it's bad, right? <laughs> I think everyone can hear that. There isn't many people that go uh, here something out of tune and and sort of starts jamming to it i can i I'll start get up and <laughs> well, dance to that. well I, hang on now hang on now i i can make the argument that right <laughs> that like like the guy mentioned death metal like you know has anybody heard any of that crap i, I mean i call it crap but i mean yeah. right there's lots of people that love that stuff it's like it's like well why what what makes that good to you it's I, like gibberish though isn't it uh, well, I would I, say I would say that uh, because that kind of aggressive, let's say music, I don't call it. I music, haven't. But, <laughs> but but I uh, hang on, Rob. Uh, All right, hang but, on, Rob. But uh, it produces so many decibels and so many uh, hits, like baseball bat hitting your head. So it, it is. <laughs> it is just uh, like uh, like taking drugs. So it. it, it, it it creates some state of, uh, let's, uh, mental state or psychological state, like trance or whatever, and they yeah. just are induced into that by that. Yeah, kind of, yeah. Some people just like it, so I, I I don't know why, but but there are people that just like it. Well, the and, people that are producing that rhythm must know what that rhythm is going to do, of, don't you of think? Course, of course, they uh, do. Yeah. That, and That's my I, I I heard some interview with uh, uh, let's say declared Satanist Satanists uh, about music, how they do that. So, uh, Rob, go ahead. And do you yes, see? yeah, okay. So, I've actually heard some of this Christian death metal. I, I have a little bit of an opinion, but only because I've also listened to a lot of other metal. And I, like to be honest, I'm not really a big heavy metal fan. Like I, I listen to hip hop and I listen to like classical music. But 
uh, it depends on your mood and what you're trying to do. Like if I want to go to the gym and work out heavy, I will put on some death metal. But if I'm relaxing at home, there's no way I'm ever going to listen to death metal. But, it but definitely... if, I go to, if I go to the gym, I will put on music like that. Yeah, yeah. Creating an emotional state, though, right, as well. Right. Exactly. I mean, it does go back to that. Yeah. If you're just trying to run away from it, Rob. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what it is, but it gets it's your blood powerful. pumping. Yeah. It basically empowers it. Like, in the gym, it empowers it. It gives you that sort of, uh, that delusion of, you know, being the best build, build you know, bodybuilder on earth and he can lift heavy, heavy whatever uh, object, you know what I mean? So I, it's just a mental state, really. Yeah. I would say that it is just psychological reaction for that kind of noise. Uh, it just gives you adrenaline. adrenaline. It and if this is the same thing is drums uh, for, uh, for uh, military. So uh, you, you you know that historical films where um, army is marching against uh, mar another army and uh, there are drummers and they are mm -hmm. drumming so they are creating that kind of uh, uh, state let's say psychological state that right. gives adrenaline. Well, that's why he that's why he gave the example of. Uh, in American football games, you know, the Guns N' Roses comes in <laughs> before that to get the, the crowd, crowd pumped up. Yeah, that's yes. exactly so what it does. Nothing, nothing happens and people are nervous. <laughs> <laughs> yes. yeah, right, right. But I think, uh, so overall, this was, uh, guys, this is fantastic. I, I listened to this like twice, th this particular 30 minutes. And I got more out of this. How long has it been? Three hours, four hours <laughs> Yeah. with you, three and a half hours with you guys. I, looking at things, all new types of things. This is only the first that one. That was really cool. I think we should do the other one tomorrow, to be honest. I think we should say this has been a, a success. If everybody's all right, we'll do exactly yeah, the right. same again tomorrow with the next one of these, which is even... Fucking better. More mind blowing. Yeah. Holy I'm hell, in. yeah. Okay, I'm gonna get out of here. I will see you guys tomorrow at noon. Thank you very All much. All right, Rob. Have a great night, Rob. See you guys. Yeah, yeah this is this has been great. Thanks, Bev. Again. Those videos I send you obviously have nothing to do with what we're doing here, but I would like you to watch them, and I would love to hear your opinion on those. Because I think probably both videos are a total of twenty minutes or so, maybe. I don't remember, but uh, I'd like to hear your opinion on his interpretation of Plato's cave, though. Yeah, I, well, that's I, tomorrow. I, we do we do that tomorrow. Yeah, the cave is tomorrow. <laughs> I, so, John, the one the videos that you that you put there, they were like um, somebody reading a book, is what it what I got. He wrote like, the book. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it was it was the reading of the book, I think, because it was it was the first one was like an hour or something. I think. No, it wasn't. Yeah, yeah. Hang on. Hang on. Maybe, maybe 45 minutes, the first one. Hang on. Because I opened it up and I, and I, and I said, uh, yeah, I can't. I'm gonna I can't spend that kind of time it, right now. It blew me away, though, Kevin. Not right now. You, it, it is really, really, really interesting, in my opinion. Well, I just, I, the reason why I bring it up is because I, I just wanted to make sure if that was the right thing that I was reading or if it, or if it was maybe the, yeah, the, for the first one's 48 minutes, okay. 43 and minutes. The sorry. One was 15. And the second one's 15. Yeah. Okay. Okay. But it's, it's not a video video, right? It's a reading of some, of something is no, what it, I got. It's, it. it's how he, it, he, he wrote the book and he's commenting mm -hmm. and, and giving excerpts from the book, but uh, blew me away, man. Blew me away. And it resonated for sure. For sure. Okay. Oh. Okay. Yeah. So it's, it's a dialogue because there's no, like, there's no video part portion of it. It's all the same. Uh, I don't think he puts any visuals to it. No. Right. Okay. Okay. That, and that's, and, okay. and what's, the, what's great about that is no visuals and it kept my interest. I didn't want it to end. I said, Oh my God, I got to buy the book. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. I promise I'll, uh, I'll listen to it. Yeah. I, Kevin, if that doesn't blow you away, 
I don't know what to say. I, I will I will definitely listen to it. I, I love yeah, yeah, really, really, really interesting and uh, just put a whole new light on uh the way to look at things for me. Yeah, has by the way, has anybody anybody that's still with us, has anybody read the cave or do they know the story of the cave? Do we even do we even do that? Do you want to do that tomorrow, Bev, as a like a a primer? Well, <clears throat> or let it just flow. Well, we do go over it tomorrow, don't we? The allegory of the cave within the the other book. But I mean, I would say to anybody, if you want to um, go over it, I suppose you can just type in the allegory of the cave. But what you've got to be careful of is that um, you want to be coming in with your own opinions on it. Yeah, you don't want to be swayed by other people so you too, too late for me yeah well i mean you can watch it <laughs> too a few, late for you me. can watch a few others right because yeah, no i yeah no, I, yeah okay i hear what you're saying but it's it's deeper than what you think right i personally oh think god, it, yes. like um oh my god yes the matrix and all of that sort of stuff all comes from Bev, this Bev, i wish you would watch yes. those videos as well if you could have though if you could guys could watch that and have it in the back of your mind while we're going over this as a contrast oh god i think i think it would be well we can go over it um of its own, John. I mean, yeah, why, 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 would, I why wanna, couldn't I we? I don't want to force you to do anything. Yeah, yeah sure. Well, I'm, I'm saying we're, we're doing this course, but this goes that deep that we need to go over the Republic, through the whole of the Republic. We need to be able to go over other people's opinions of what that cave is. So yeah. we can do that. What you're talking about there is a video as a specialist one-on-one, -on -one, right? There's no need to incorporate it into this bit. Let's do a right. special on it. Hey, hey John. Right, right. I, okay, I, yeah, I, yeah. Let me say this, because you might... So here's the thing, and, and this is good for anybody that's joined us now from, like, YouTube. Like, Mike is still here. I don't know if he's still awake or not. But it's, <laughs> right. There's, there's other, like, who knows is here. So... We talked about this on the Discord. I I'm blessed to have a job that I can sit and talk with Bev most of my day from the time I get up in the morning. Mike is now saying he's still up, <laughs> 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 right? Most of the morning uh, until uh, you know until I talk. We we get have have the show and stuff. But if you if you don't know where Bev is going and taking the channel now is none of this stuff is off limits, John. None of it. It's like we need to start having conversations and it doesn't matter what it is or what the topic is. Like, let's have the conversations like so. Yeah. No, if we, if we want to go through those two videos that you said and, and do that, like as a special, like deconstruct, not deconstruct. I, I hate, hate that being guy responsible for what could be boring to other people or something. Well, like who that. cares? It doesn't be people. Look, people can come and go as they please. Not everybody's going to like all this stuff. It's fine. No, I, hear right? you. I hear you. It's fine. But, but the, the, the point is, is the conversation, right? That's, Bev has been saying this forever. Like we're in it for the conversation. We're in it for the conversation. We're in it for the conversation. We're in it for the Those conversation. Those videos don't provoke a conversation. Well, there you I'm go. Like... So, so you know, Bev has been trying to have conversation with certain, you know, certain group of people as he calls them, and they won't let the conversation. They won't let any conversation happen. None. It's like as soon as you try to have a conversation with anybody else, those people come in and say, "Don't have a conversation." Yeah, they try it's and like, stifle it. They, they like at yeah. inception, those guys place a model in the way of what the conversation was and what the conversation is. They put roadblocks in all the time. Yeah, we're in it for the conversation, and mm -hmm. it's not a matter of right or wrong or my view or we're teaching something and you have to ab abide by our dogma. We're not. It's like no, I hear you. It's it's me. It's me personally. I just don't like to be the one to initiate it. I am like if I can walk into the conversation that I'm already interested in. That's great because you know I can be more relaxed when I'm initiating uh, you guys to look at something. I feel you know responsible to carry that over and make it really interesting for you guys. <laughs> yeah, well, you can't. Right, no, you can't make it. I am a weird I know, person. I hear, you. I hear you, buddy. I hear you. Yeah. But you can't, like, like, don't let that stop you from at least. And you did. You suggested. I'm glad you did. But, but yeah. I mean, look, shit, man. That's, let's that's let's logos. talk about a lot of stuff. Yeah, it is. John, you don't feel that that's sort of bad because 
That's how we find Logos, right? The journeys that we get, somebody says, watch this video. So you watch it and you go, oh my God, I'm going to have to get somebody else to watch it. And that's where we go. That's what we're doing. That's the whole point of what this particular course started just like that. That That's why we're all here now. So this, the one that you've just brought, is actually part of the same thing. Right, that because yeah, we're doing was, this course, then you brought I, that. It was a synchronicity today when mm -hmm. I saw that, and I was just watching that when I saw your thing come up about what you're talking about today. I said, Oh, god, I don't believe it. And that's why I went in the oh, Discord early mm -hmm. this morning and dropped those videos. That's oh, exactly gosh. it. There you go. That's it. What I'm gonna do is, I'm um, I'm still recording, I've not finished recording, but what I'm gonna be doing with this is, I'm this is part of the channel now, right? This is what we are going to be doing. These sort of conversations are the conversations that need to be had. Um, and they will further our progress within the conversations that we are going to have. I'm not really bothered about other people and what they think because I know that they aren't the ones that can have these conversations. <laughs> yeah, so we don't sure. need them. That they're, they're of no use to us. They've served their purpose. They've taught me everything I need to know about them. And mostly about that is that there are only a few people that can actually talk about this. So it's not worth talking and focusing on the people that can't. The rest of them are just sophists mm -hmm. yeah, if you're trying to do a thing. Yep. If you remember, right at the first video you played today, what the first thing the guy says about the, the highest thing you can attain is uh, was something about conversation. Uh, I think I remember it verbatim, but boy, that made sense because I think I remember having that type of conversation where it just everybody's wonder comes together yep. and there's an exhilaration there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. within you that you know you guys are you're all on the same path the same, same thought process and, and, and i've experienced that here and i've here experienced that other places so yeah he that was a very true statement the way he opened that up for me yeah, yeah. absolutely and e even it, that's why i brought up also the idea that you know take what you like and leave the rest because you could still feel that exhilaration and that like community and camaraderie even though you might disagree with certain things right it's good and bring up the disagreements that's what a discussion is it isn't like oh yeah bev said this and i'm gonna be in 100 percent agreement with it and let me tell you why and and then anybody who afterwards that would want to disagree goes well i can't i can't disagree now no disagree bring it up let's call let's talk no one talks anymore no yeah. one debates anymore that's what bev's tried to have <laughs> debate with all these people right Ah, gee. Yeah, that's the world that's being created around us, though. Everybody's afraid to talk about anything. Right? Right. Yeah. And we shouldn't be, right? Especially at this no. time, right? This is the time that people need to hear intelligent conversation. Like, what I sussed out a fair bit ago is that within the arena that we're in, and people have given us labels, whatever labels they want to give us, um, they need to have... Uh, people to come and stifle conversation because it cannot be seen that these people that have been labelled um, not very bright to have intelligent conversations that aren't ha being had anywhere else. So I've been fighting every time that we've been anywhere. That's the reason we're here, is that if you go out anywhere else, that you literally cannot have these conversations. There will be somebody out there to stifle it, whatever way they can. But over these years that we've generated this place, um, we're now in a position to have these conversations in this place. There's nobody going to come in. There's no lemon. There's no rumpus. There's no <laughs> Zanuck to talk shit, right? They're just not around to come and stifle it. So this is going to be the place where you're actually going to be able to have conversations and feel free to come in if you have any ideas. Um, what we don't want to seem like, this is for anybody new that's around here or anybody that's listening that wants to come in. We don't want to seem like we're an elitist group. We're far from it. We, we are all just normal people. 
Why I do you train feel, myself. You, why do you Learn feel it. like people view you that way as an elitist group? Well, I, I did, I've never got that feeling from you guys at all. Well, yeah, I know. I'm just thinking that people that are listening in, if they're um, unable to uh, access logic, right, for the first time, maybe they're not um, very geometrical and some of the terms that we're using, some of the words that we're using, the way we talk uh, to each other, they they may just never have heard it before, you know, this type yeah, of you. conversation. Yeah, and it, it, it's easy to come in and get involved in it just because there's a few people in the room also. That's no reason to, um, you know, not come in and participate in it. And and, and the I'll tell you the other thing that you, that you just made me think of, Bev, is th this whole idea about the arts and music and poetry and these kinds of things that, as this guy is positing, right, is the basis for philosophy. That means if you're not into logic yet, right, you're not in, into it, you're not you're not on the trivium train that, that many yeah. of us have been on, but maybe you're more into music and poetry and the arts come in because apparently these things are linked. Yeah. They're linked. Who would have freaking thought yeah. they're linked? Well, all well, of the things are linked, right? We, yes. I, I always think that the conversation is what we're after. And there's something from everybody that can be learned. Everybody can fit into whatever this is because there's no specialists here. This is this is a thought thing. It's just what goes on in your mind. Everybody has their own thoughts. Sometimes they may be completely unique. Somebody else may have never even heard of that before. So one sentence um, said by somebody can inspire all sorts of new thoughts that some people may have never even thought of. That's so true. Yes, absolutely right. And uh, uh, <laughs> so, so here's another thing uh, that uh, you know we're going to have more and more and more of these uh, conversations. Uh, it, people that are going to be hearing this stuff on on YouTube or uh, you know whatever the case might be. If you if you feel like you uh, uh, haven't been heard or you think there's uh, some sort of, you know, greater truth or you call yourself a truther or whatever the case might be. If you think there's a, a, a that there is a bunch of elites out there, if you might think that there's a cabal that's, you know, running everything, that's all well and good. I'll tell you one thing. Any if that all if all, any of that is true, they don't want us talking. Right. The, even if you don't think there's a cabal, just politicians. Think about the, think about politicians or governments or whatever. They don't want people with potential differences talking to one another and having conversations. They don't. Why want are they it. allowing us to do it, Kevin? It's freaking dangerous. They don't allow it. We're just this little tiny group in the corner of an but internet. They John. can stop this if they wanted to, don't you? If think? they want to, maybe they will. If they want to, maybe they will. But what I will say is. The, the it's the learning how to do that that's important right the learning how to communicate with one another how how to disagree with one another without shooting someone or wanting to choke the crap out of them right that's important that's what we're learning here and it's i realize it's potentially dangerous i don't give a shit uh, i well, like I mean, it you, you can say that right but really what are we doing Right, we we're talking about yep. um, the old philosophers, ancient philosophers. We're yep. talking about yep. uh, geometric facts, mm -hmm. and we're talking about logic, formulating yep. arguments. Yep. Um, we are doing nothing wrong. Only Absolutely. the con as long as we play by the rules, and the rules That's are you create know. a thought structure within people that is doesn't comply with the bullshit they're putting through the television. Well, again, that's <laughs> you'll get into that tomorrow. It will become pretty obvious yes. tomorrow. Yes. All yes. of that stuff, right? Which is on the cards. It's on the table. We can talk about it um, because it's right there. As long as we keep it within context. And right. we can. We have the perfect tools here. 
within it's, philosophy for to, for us to entertain these uh, topics and thoughts. It's the conversation. My point, yeah. I guess my point is it's the conversation that's important, right? It's the ability for a group of people to come together, discuss these things, have differences of opinion potentially about these things, come to an agreement or consensus about, about things. And, and just that is dangerous. Just that being able to have people come together and discuss things as intellectual human beings is uh, to some people dangerous. You, you see them all the time. That's Bev said it right in this particular arena, you start having a discussion with someone else and like he said, a Zanuck or a lemon will come in and completely destroy any possible chance of having a coherent conversation. I could guarantee that if we have the live button click now on YouTube, uh, they'd be in here. Yeah, they'd, they'd be have in here to, or they'd in have YouTube. to be in yeah. here to shut it down. Yeah, they're distracting yeah. or doing something. Yeah, that's yep. what's good about this. So thank you, everybody, for coming in here. This yeah. has been amazing and this is exactly where what we're going to be doing and where we're going to be going the problem is um what well, one i'd like more people to join and feel open enough to do that now do we do it live on youtube or do we go into a room and sort of do it live or do we do it like this and then put it out on youtube yeah that, that's an interesting question but that can be decided right because that's up to us this is um uh, for everybody to to be involved in this isn't just for me or whatever uh, because i'm not here for that <laughs> but i'm here for the conversation and the best way for us to have the conversation to get more people involved in it i think personally is to get keep them away from the wallies and the xanax mm -hmm. and the trolls you d yes. they don't want them to be we've we've made a discord server now where they they're watching Everybody in the live chat, just know that if you comment anything in the live chat, there are hundreds of trolls watching and observing everything that gets posted. So they're still watching, but they're not in here. They're not harassing anybody. Likelihoods, if it, you may be getting messages from them telling you whatever. But as far as it is at the minute, it's not as though it is when we go live. So... I, I really like this. I would prefer this sort of thing. But I don't know. The moment we put it out there, that's when we start getting trouble. <laughs> yeah. Even if you were doing it live, Bev, you don't have to respond to the trolls in the live chat, do you? No, I'm well, saying that they would. They'd be doing everything they could. They'd be making. Yeah. They'd be marking everybody that's in here. They'll be sending oh. you DMs, and but mm -hmm. what I'm after is trying to get more people to come in. Uh, right. As it is, this place has a really bad name because of the trolls giving us a bad name when we're nothing like what they all say we do, right? And what all they say we're like here. We don't over-talk people. We don't mute people. We don't do any of that sort of stuff that all of the other servers actually oh. do. Seem to be gentlemen here mm. and ladies when when we're having the conversations. Yeah, I mean that's exactly right. Uh, Benny actually said that. So one of the last things Benny posted, Bev, if you saw it in the live chat, mm. was I prefer this. I prefer this than YouTube, possibly. Yeah, yeah. Like we've yeah. been saying for quite a while, that what we do on YouTube isn't uh, anything like this place. YouTube is a live show. And then this place as not live is completely different. We much freer to talk about other things. And there's way more tactics and stuff that um, we do talk about, right? We've seen multitudes of things that we haven't made videos about. I've talked with people. Um, I've talked with quite a few people and I've particularly held them conversations back because they wouldn't look good. They're not good for the people who had the conversations with us. Some of them are quite sad, actually. And pitiful. Don't like doing that. It's just trying to inform people, really, of what's going on. So if anybody takes whatever from what we're talking about, it is literally just 
a group of normal people talking about something that they may not have heard about before. Some people have actually heard about this, but most of us, this philosophy is something that I don't think any of us imagined. You know, like I'd come to a, the age I am and I'd be on Discord talking to a load of people about philosophy. Like, come on. Pretty cool, huh? It is. Yeah, but it it's is. there for everyone, isn't it? That's the point about this the whole thing. It doesn't hurt. Yeah. yeah. It doesn't hurt. It doesn't hurt. And let me say one. <laughs> so I'm going to get in so much trouble. <laughs> um, so, so let me, uh, without saying anybody specific, let me just say if, and this is for the recording too, if it goes out, right? If people come in and you're listening and you stop yourself from saying something, for whatever reason, don't, if, 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 you know, maybe I think I'm not smart enough. Maybe I think I'm going to say the wrong words. It's impossible, right? That's the whole point of the conversation. It's impossible for that, to, for, for you to say anything bad or for you to say anything that's not going to be respected. So this is not that I can't stress it enough. This is not the other places that you might have been on Discord or these, it, that's not what, what we're trying to do here. This time is for real, real discussions and there is no judgment on, well, gee, that was a stupid thing to say. None of that's going to happen. So you can just let your, be at ease. You know, if you've got something to say, I, it might take some people a long time if they come into a Discord to even be able to talk, but get it out there, get it out there. Yeah, this is even for the globe, right? You can be a whatever globe you have, whatever monad you have, whatever religion you are, doesn't matter. This is about thought. It, it, it literally doesn't matter for any of those things, for what we're talking about here, especially Plato and the Republic. No yeah. model, no religion, nothing matters other than the conversation. So it is open to everyone of all sorts, as long as we can just talk about stuff. Mm -hmm. This has been great. Thanks, Bev. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank I you very run. much. Thank yeah. dinner. I think I'm going to end up this uh, recording. <laughs> thank you very Catch you all later. I have to go to bed. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah, I see a paper. Late for, late, like very late for paper. Half past uh, hey, one. paper, you know too much, dude, man. You, you pressed the hell out of me. <laughs> Uh, yes, uh, sometimes you, you will have to pay the price for knowing too, too much. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you very much, okay. people. Thank you, Thanks, everybody, everybody. Else for being good here. Night. Good night, good night, good night.